Chapter 20 The quickest way to reach San Pietro from Leonardo's workshop was by taking the ferry or hiring a boat from the Fondamenta Nuova and sailing east from the north shores of the city. To his surprise, Ezio found it hard to get anyone to take him there. The regular ferries had been suspended, and it was only by digging deep into his pockets that he managed to persuade a pair of young gondoliers to make the journey. What's the problem? he asked them. Word is there's been some bad fighting down there, said the aft oarsman, straining against choppy water. Seems that it's died down now, just a local feud, but the ferries aren't risking starting up again just yet. We'll drop you on the north foreshore, just keep an eye out for yourself. They did as they had promised. Ezio soon found himself alone, plodding up a muddy bank to the brick retaining wall, from where he could see the spire of the church of San Pietro di Castello a short way off. What he could also see was several plumes of smoke rising from a group of low brick buildings some distance southeast of the church. They were Bartolomeo's barracks. His heart pounding, Ezio hastened in their direction. The first thing that struck him was the silence. Then, as he drew nearer, he began to see dead bodies strewn around, some of the men wearing the blazon of Silvio Barbarigo, others a device he did not recognize. Finally, he came upon a sergeant, badly wounded but still alive, who had managed to prop himself up against a low wall. Please, help me, said the sergeant when Ezio approached. Ezio searched around quickly and located the well from which he drew water, praying that the attackers had not poisoned it, though it looked clean and clear enough. He poured some into a beaker he'd found and put it gently to the man's lips, then moistened a cloth and wiped the blood from his face. Thank you, friend, said the sergeant. Ezio noticed that he wore the unfamiliar badge and guessed that it must be Bartolomeo's. Evidently Bartolomeo's troops had been worsted by Silvio's. It was a surprise attack, the sergeant confirmed. Some whore of Bartolomeo's betrayed us. Where have they gone now? The Inquisitor's men. Back to the arsenal. They've established a base there just before the new doge could take control. Silvio hates his cousin Agostino because he isn't part of whatever plot the Inquisitor's involved in. The man coughed blood but endeavoured to continue. Took our captain prisoner. Carried him off with them. Funny, really. We were just planning to attack them. Bartolomeo was simply waiting for... a messenger from the city. Where are the rest of your men now? The sergeant tried to look around. Those that weren't killed or taken prisoner scattered. Tried to save themselves. They'll be lying low in Venice and on the islands in the lagoon. But they'll need someone to unite behind. They'll be waiting for word of the captain. And he's a prisoner of Silvio. Yes, he... But the unfortunate sergeant here started to fight for breath. His struggle ended as his mouth opened and a shower of blood streamed from it, drenching the grass for three yards in front of him. By the time the flow had stopped, the man's eyes were staring sightlessly in the direction of the lagoon. Ezio closed them for him and crossed his arms on his chest. Requiescat in pace, he said solemnly. Then he hitched his sword belt tighter. He had also strapped the guard brace to his left forearm, but had left off the double-bladed dagger attachment. To his right forearm he had attached the poison blade, always so useful when faced with huge odds. The pistol, most useful when a single certain target was in view, as it had to be reloaded after each firing, he kept in his belt pouch with powder and shot, and the original spring blade as backup. He pulled up his hood and headed for the wooden bridge which connected San Pietro to Castello. From there he made his way unobtrusively but quickly down the main street in the direction of the arsenal. He noticed that the people around him were subdued, though they went about their daily work as usual. It would take more than a local war to stop the business of Venice entirely, though of course few of the ordinary citizens of Castello could know just how important for their city the outcome of this conflict was. Ezio didn't know then that it would be a conflict which would drag on for many, many months, indeed, into the following year. He thought of Christina, of his mother Maria and his sister Claudia. 
and he felt himself to be homeless and getting older. But there was the creed to be served and upheld, and that was more important than anything else. No one, perhaps, would ever know that their world had been saved from the dominion of the Templars by the select order of assassins, which had pledged itself to opposing their evil hegemony. His first task was clearly to locate and, if possible, free Bartolomeo d'Alviano, but getting into the arsenal would be hard. Surrounded by high brick fortified walls and containing a warren of buildings and shipyards, it stood at the eastern limit of the main city, and it was heavily guarded by Silvio's private army, whose numbers seemed to exceed the two hundred mercenaries Agostino Barbarigo had told him of. Ezio, passing the architect Gamballo's recently built main gate, wandered round the outside perimeters of the building as far as they were accessible by land, until he came to a heavy door with a wicket gate built into it, and, observing from a distance, saw that this unobtrusive entry was used by guards on the outside when they changed shift. He had to wait unobtrusively for four hours, but at the next shift change he was ready. It was baking hot in the late afternoon sun. The atmosphere was humid, and everyone except Ezio was torpid. He watched as the relief soldiers marched out through the gate, which had only one guard, and then followed the mercenaries coming off shift, bringing up the rear and blending in as best he could. Once the last soldier was through, he cut the throat of the guard posted at the gate and slipped through it himself before anyone had noticed what was happening. As had happened years ago at San Gimignano, Silvio's force here, big as it was, wasn't sufficient to cover the entire area it guarded. It was, after all, the city's military focal point. No wonder Agostino couldn't wield any real power without control of it. Once inside, it was relatively easy to move about between the wide open spaces between the huge buildings, the Cordelia, the Artiglieri, the shot towers, and above all, the shipyards. As long as Ezio kept to the dark late afternoon shadows and took care to avoid the patrols within the vast complex, he knew he would be all right, though naturally he remained extremely vigilant. Guided at last by the sounds of merriment and mocking laughter, he found his way to the side of one of the main dry docks into which a massive galley was drawn. On the side of one of the dock's massive walls, an iron cage had been hung. In it was Bartolomeo, a vigorous bear of a man in his early thirties, and so just four or five years Ezio's senior. Around him was a crowd of Silvio's mercenaries, and Ezio thought how much better employed they'd have been patrolling than triumphing over an enemy they'd already rendered helpless. But he reflected that Silvio Barbarigo, Grand Inquisitor though he was, was not experienced in matters of handling troops. Ezio didn't know how long Bartolomeo had been chained up in his cage, certainly for many hours, but his anger and energy seemed unaffected by his ordeal. Given that he'd almost certainly been given nothing to eat or drink, this was remarkable. Luridi codardi! Filthy cowards! He was shouting at his tormentors, one of whom, Ezio noticed, had dipped a sponge in vinegar and was pushing it up to Bartolomeo's lips on the tip of a lance in the hope that he'd think it was water. Bartolomeo spat it away. I'll take you all on, at the same time! With one arm, no, both arms tied behind my back. I'll fucking eat you alive, he laughed. <laughs> you must be wondering how such a thing could be even possible. But just let me out of here and I'll gladly demonstrate. Miserabili pezzi di merda. The Inquisitor's guards howled in derision and poked at Bartolomeo with poles, making the cage swing. It had no solid bottom and Bartolomeo had to grip hard with his feet on the bars beneath to keep his balance. You have no honour, no valour, no virtue! He summoned enough saliva into his mouth to spit down at them. And people wonder why the star of Venice has begun to wane! Then his voice took on almost a pleading tone. I'll show mercy to whomever here has the courage to release me. All the rest of you are going to die, by my hand. I swear it! Save your fucking breath, one of the guards called out. No one's going to die today but you, you fucking turdbag. 
All this time, Ezio, sheltered by the shadow of a brick colonnade that skirted a basin where some of the smaller war galleys were moored, was working out a way of saving the condottiero. There were ten guards around the cage, all with their backs to him, and there was none other in view. What was more, they were off duty and had no armour on. Ezio checked his poison dagger. Dispatching the guards should present no difficulty. He timed the passing of the on-duty patrols, and they came by every time the shadow of the dock wall lengthened by three inches. But there was the additional problem of releasing Bartolomeo, keeping him quiet while doing so, and making quick work of it. He thought hard. He knew there wasn't much time. What sort of man sells his honour and dignity for a few pieces of silver? Bartolomeo was bellowing. But his throat was getting dry and he was running out of steam, despite his iron will. Isn't that what you do, fuckwit? Aren't you a mercenary like us? I have never been in the service of a traitor and a coward as you are. Bartolomeo's eyes glittered. The men standing beneath him were momentarily cowed. Do you think I don't know why you've chained me up? Do you think I don't know who your boss Silvio's puppet master is? I've been fighting the weasel who controls him since most of you boys were puppies, suckling your mother's teats. Ezio was now listening with interest. One of the soldiers picked up a half-brick and threw it angrily. It bounced harmlessly off the bars of the cage. That's right, you fuckers! Bartolomeo yelled hoarsely. You just try it on with me. I swear, once I'm free of this cage, I'm going to make it my mission to sever each and every one of your fucking heads and shove them up your fucking girly asses. And I'll mix and match the heads too, because you little tykes clearly don't know your heads from your asses anyway. The men below were getting seriously angry now. It was clear that only orders prevented them from stabbing the man to death with their pikes or shooting arrows at him as he hung defencelessly above them in his cage. But by now Ezio had seen that the padlock which secured the door of the cage was relatively small. Bartolomeo's captors relied on the fact that the cage was hung high. No doubt they intended that the harsh sun of the day and chill of the night, coupled with dehydration and starvation, would finish him off unless he broke down and agreed to talk. But from the look of him, that was something Bartolomeo would never do. Ezio knew he had to act fast. An on-duty patrol would pass by very shortly. Releasing the spring on his poison blade, he moved forward with the speed and grace of a wolf, covering the distance in a matter of seconds. He scythed through the group and had sliced death into the bodies of five men before the others knew what was happening. Drawing his sword, he savagely killed the rest, their vain blows glancing off the metal guard on his left forearm, while Bartolomeo watched open-mouthed. At last, silent. Ezio turned and looked up. Can you jump from there? he asked. If you can get me out, I'll jump like a fucking flea! Ezio grabbed one of the dead soldier's pikes. Its point was iron, not steel, and cast, not forged. It would do. Balancing it in his left hand, he prepared himself, crouched, and sprang into the air, at last clinging to the outer bars of the cage. Bartolomeo looked at him, pop-eyed. How in buggery did you do that? he asked. Training, said Ezio, smiling tightly. He forced the point of the pike through the hasp of the lock and twisted. It resisted at first, then broke. Ezio pulled the door open, free-falling to the ground as he did so, and landing with the grace of a cat. Now you jump, he ordered. Be quick. Who are you? Get on with it. Nervously, Bartolomeo braced himself against the open door of the cage and then flung himself forwards. He landed heavily, the breath knocked out of him. But when Ezio helped him to his feet, he shook his rescuer off proudly. I'm all right, he huffed. I'm just not used to doing fucking circus tricks. No bones broken, then. Fuck you, whoever you are, said Bartolomeo, beaming. But you have my thanks. And to Ezio's surprise, he gave him a bear hug. Who are you, anyway? The arch-fucking angel Gabriel, or what? My name is Auditore, Ezio. Bartolomeo Dalviani. Delighted. We haven't got time for this, Ezio snapped, as you well know. Don't try to teach me my job, acrobat, 
said Bartolomeo, still quite genially. Anyway, I owe you one for this. But they had already wasted too much time. Someone must have noticed from the ramparts what was going on, for now alarm bells started to ring, and patrols emerged from the buildings nearby to close on them. Come on, you bastards! bellowed Bartolomeo, swinging fists that made Dante Moros look like panelling hammers. It was Ezio's turn to look on admiringly as Bartolomeo ploughed into the oncoming soldiers. Together they beat their way back to the wicket gate and at last were clear. Let's get out of here, Ezio exclaimed. Shouldn't we break a few more heads? Perhaps we should try to avoid conflict for now. Are you afraid? Just practical. I know your blood's up, but they do outnumber us by one hundred to one. Bartolomeo considered. You have a point. And after all, I'm a commander. I ought to think like one, not leave it to some whippersnapper like you to make me see sense. And then he lowered his voice and said in a concerned tone, I just hope my little Bianca is safe. Ezio didn't have time to question or even wonder about Bartolomeo's aside. They had to make tracks, and they did racing through the town back towards Bartolomeo's headquarters on San Pietro. But not before Bartolomeo had made two important diversions, to the Riva San Basio and the Corte Nuova, to alert his agents in those places that he was alive and free, and to summon his scattered forces, those who had not been taken prisoner, to regroup. Back at San Pietro at dusk, they found that a handful of Bartolomeo's condottieri had survived the attack, and had now emerged from their hiding places, moving among the already fly-blown dead and attempting to bury them and put matters in order. They were elated to see their captain again, but he was distracted, running here and there in his encampment, calling mournfully, Bianca! Bianca! Where are you? Who's he after? Ezio asked a sergeant at arms. She must be worth a lot to him. She is, signore, grinned the sergeant, and far more reliable than most of her sex. Ezio ran to catch up with his new ally. Is everything all right? What do you think? Look at the state of this place. And poor Bianca, if something's happened to her. The big man shouldered a door, already half off its hinges, onto the ground, and entered a bunker which, from the look of it, must have been a map room before the attack. The valuable maps had been mutilated or stolen, but Bartolomeo sifted through the wreckage until, with a cry of triumph, Bianca! Oh, my darling, thank God you're all right! He had pulled a massive greatsword clear of the rubble and brandished it, roaring. Aha! You're safe! I never doubted it! Bianca, meet... What's your name again? Auditore, Ezio. Bartolomeo looked thoughtful. Of course. Your reputation goes before you, Ezio. I'm glad of it. What brings you here? I, too, have business with Silvio Barbarigo. I think he's outstayed his welcome in Venice. Silvio, that turd! He needs flushing down a fucking latrine! I thought I might be able to rely on your help. After that rescue? I owe you my life, let alone my help. How many men do you have? How many survivors here, Sergeant-at-Arms? The sergeant-at-arms Ezio had spoken to earlier came running up and saluted. Twelve, Capitano, including you and me, and this gentleman here. Thirteen, shouted Bartolomeo, waving Bianca. Against a good two hundred, said Ezio. He turned to the sergeant-at-arms. And how many of your men did they take prisoner? Most of them, the man replied. The attack took us completely by surprise. Some fled, but Silvio's men took far more away with them in chains. Look, Ezio, said Bartolomeo, I'm going to supervise rounding up the rest of my men who are at liberty. I'll get this place cleaned up and bury my dead and we'll regroup here. Do you think in the meantime you can see to the business of liberating the men Silvio's taken prisoner? Since that's a thing you seem to be very good at. Intensi. Get back here with them as soon as you can. Good luck. Ezio, his codex weapons buckled on, headed westward again towards the arsenal, but wondered if Silvio would have kept all Bartolomeo's men prisoner there. He hadn't seen any of them when he had gone to rescue their captain. At the arsenal itself, 
he stuck to the shadows of the falling night and tried to listen to the conversations of the guards stationed along the perimeter walls. Have you ever seen bigger cages? said one. No, and the poor bastards are crammed into them like sardines. I don't think Captain Bartow would have treated us like that if he'd been the victor, said his comrade. Of course he would. And keep your noble thoughts to yourself if you want to keep your head on your shoulders. I say finish them off. Why don't we just lower the cages into the basins and drown the lot of them? At that, Ezio tensed. There were three huge rectangular basins inside the arsenal, each designed to hold thirty galleys. They were on the north side of the complex, surrounded by thick brick walls and covered by heavy wooden roofs. Doubtless the cages, larger versions of the one which had imprisoned Bartolomeo, were suspended by chains over the water in one or more of the Bacini. One hundred and fifty trained men. That'd be a waste. For my money, Silvio's hoping to turn them to our cause, said the second uniform. Well, they're mercenaries like us, so why not? Right. They just need to be softened up a little first. Show them who's boss. Spero di si. Thank God they don't know their boss has escaped, the first guard spat. He won't last long. Ezio left them and made his way to the wicket gate he'd discovered earlier. There was no time to wait for any changing of the guard, but he could judge the time by the distance of the moon from the horizon, and he knew he had a couple of hours. He flicked the spring blade out, his original codex weapon and still his favourite, and slashed open the throat of the fat old guard Silvio had seen fit to put on duty alone there, pushing him clear before any of the man's blood could get onto his clothes. Quickly he wiped the blade clean on the grass and exchanged it for his poison blade. He made the sign of the cross over the body. The compound within the walls of the arsenal looked different by the light of a sickle moon and a few stars, but Ezio knew where the basins were located and went, skirting the walls and keeping an ever-watchful eye out for Silvio's men, to the first one. He peered through the great open arches into the watery gloom beyond, but could see nothing but galleys bobbing gently in the half-light of the stars. The second bore the same fruit, but as he approached the third, he heard voices. It's not too late for you to pledge yourselves to our cause. Only say the word and you'll be spared, one of the Inquisitor's sergeants was calling in a mocking tone. Ezio, pressing himself against the wall, saw a dozen troops, weapons laid down, bottles in their hands, gazing up into the gloom of the roof, where three massive iron cages were suspended. He saw that an invisible mechanism was slowly lowering the cages towards the water beneath, and there were no galleys in this basin. Only black, oily water, in which something unseen but frightful teemed. The Inquisitor's guards included one man who wasn't drinking, a man who seemed constantly on the alert, a huge, terrible man. Ezio instantly recognized Dante Moro. So, with the death of his master Marco, the Man Mountain had transferred his allegiance to the cousin, Silvio, the Inquisitor, who had already professed his admiration for the massive bodyguard. Ezio made his way cautiously round the walls until he came to a large open-frame box containing an arrangement of cogwheels, pulleys and ropes that might have been designed by Leonardo. This was the mechanism, driven by a water clock, which was lowering the cages. Ezio drew his ordinary dagger from its sheath on the left-hand side of his belt and jammed it between two of the cogwheels. The mechanism stopped, and not before time, for the cages were now inches from the water's surface. But the guards instantly noticed that the cage's descent had ceased, and some came running towards the machinery that controlled it. Ezio sprang out his poison blade and hacked at them as they came. Two fell into the water from the jetty and screamed briefly, sinking into the oily black water. Meanwhile, Ezio raced along the perimeter of the basin towards the others, all of whom fled in alarm save Dante, who stood his ground and loomed like a tower over Ezio. Silvio's dog now, are you? said Ezio. Better a live dog than a dead lion, said Dante, reaching out to cuff Ezio into the water. Stand down, said Ezio, ducking the blow. I have no quarrel with you. Oh, shut your face, said Dante, picking Ezio up by the scruff of the neck and bashing him against the wall of the basin. I have no serious quarrel with you either. 
he could see that Ezio was stunned. Just stay there. I must go and warn my master, but I'll be back to feed you to the fishes if you give me any more trouble. And he was gone. Ezio shook his head to clear it, and stood up, groggily. The men in the cages were shouting, and Ezio saw that one of Silvio's guards had crept back in, and was about to dislodge the dagger he'd jammed in the cage-lowering mechanism. He thanked God he had not forgotten his old knife-throwing skills learned at Monterigioni, produced a knife from his belt, and hurled it with deadly accuracy. The guard stumbled over, groaning, snatching helplessly at the blade which was buried between his eyes. Ezio snatched a gaff from a rack on the wall behind him, and, leaning over the water dangerously, deftly hauled the nearest cage towards him. Its door was closed by a simple bolt, and he shot it back, releasing the men inside, who tumbled out onto the wharf. With their help, he was able to haul in the remaining cages and release their prisoners in turn. Exhausted though they were by their ordeal, they cheered him. Come on, he cried, I've got to get you back to your captain. Once they had overwhelmed the men guarding the basins, they returned unopposed to San Pietro, where Bartolomeo and his men had an emotional reunion. In Ezio's absence, all the mercenaries who'd escaped Silvio's initial onslaught had returned, and the encampment was once again in perfetto ordine. Salute, Ezio, said Bartolomeo. Welcome back, and well done, by God! I knew I could depend on you. He took Ezio's hands between his. You are indeed the mightiest of allies. One might almost think... But then he stopped himself, and said instead, Thanks to you, my army is restored to its former glory. Now our friend Silvio will see just how grave a mistake he's made. So what should we do? Make a direct assault on the arsenal? No. A head-on assault would mean we'd be massacred at the gates. I think we should plant my men throughout the district and get them to cause enough trouble locally to tie most of Silvio's men up. So, if the arsenal is almost empty, you can take it with a hand-picked team. Let's hope he takes the bait. He's an inquisitor. He knows how to bully people who are already at his mercy. He's not a soldier. Hell, he doesn't even have the wit to be a halfway decent chess player. It took a few days to deploy Bartolomeo's condottieri about Castello and the Arsenal district. When all was ready, Bartolomeo and Ezio gathered the small group of hand-picked mercenaries they'd kept back for the assault on Silvio's bastion. Ezio himself had selected the men for their agility and skill at arms. They planned the assault on the arsenal with care. The following Friday night, all was in readiness. A mercenary was sent to the top of the tower of San Martino, and when the moon was at its height, he set off a massive Roman candle designed and provided by Leonardo's workshop. This was the signal for the attack. Dressed in dark leather gear, the condottieri of the task force scaled the walls of the arsenal on all four sides. Once over the battlements, the men moved like spectres through the quiet and undermanned fortress and quickly contained the skeleton guard within. It wasn't long before Ezio and Bartolomeo found themselves confronting their deadliest foes, Silvio and Dante. Dante, wearing iron knuckle dusters, was swinging a massive chain mace around, protecting his master. It was hard for either Ezio or Bartolomeo to come within range as their own men engaged the enemy. A fine specimen, isn't he? crowed Silvio from the safety of the ramparts. You should be honoured to die by his hand. Suck my balls, you fuck! Bartolomeo yelled back. He'd managed to snag the mace in his battle staff, and Dante, his weapon torn from his hand, retreated. Come on, Ezio! We need to catch that grassone bastardo! Dante turned, having reached his objective an iron club pierced with twisted nails, and faced them again. He swung it at Bartolomeo, and one of the nails tore a furrow in his shoulder. I'll have you for that, you pig-eyed sack of shit! bellowed Bartolomeo. Meanwhile, Ezio had loaded and fired his pistol at Silvio, and missed. His shot ricocheted off the brick walls in a shower of sparks and splinters. Do you think I don't know why you're really here, Auditore? Silvio barked, though clearly frightened by the gunshot. But you're too late. There's nothing you can do to stop us now. 
Ezio had reloaded and fired again, but he was angry and confused at Silvio's words, and once again the shot went wide. Ha! spat Silvio from the ramparts as Dante and Bartolomeo slogged it out. You pretend you don't know. Though once Dante's done with you and your muscle-bound friend, it'll hardly matter either way. You'll just follow your fool of a father. Do you know what my greatest regret is? That I couldn't have been Giovanni's hangman myself. How I would have loved to pull that lever and watch your miserable dad kick and gasp and dangle. And then, of course, there would have been plenty of time for that wine-sack of an uncle of yours, Ciccione Mario, and you're not quite past it, mother, Droopy Dugs Maria, and that luscious little strawberry Claudia, your sister. How long it's been since I fucked anything under twenty-five. Mind you, I'd keep the last two for the voyage. It can get quite lonely out at sea. Through the red mist of his fury, Ezio concentrated on the information the spittle-strewn lips of the Inquisitor were madly spewing forth along with the insults. By now, Silvio's guards, at superior odds, were beginning to rally against Bartolomeo's commandos. Dante dealt another swinging blow at Bartolomeo, thumping him in the ribcage with his knuckle-dusters and causing him to falter. Ezio fired a third bullet at Silvio, and this time it ripped through the Inquisitor's robes close to his neck. But though the man staggered, and Ezio saw a thin line of blood, he did not fall. He shouted a command to Dante, who fell back, swarming up to the rampart to join his master, and with him disappearing over the other side of the wall. Ezio knew there'd be a ladder on the other side to take them down to the jetty, and yelling to Bartolomeo to follow him, he dashed out of the arena of battle to cut his foes off. He saw them clambering into a large boat, but noticed the anger and despair on their faces. Following their gaze, he saw a huge black galley disappearing across the lagoon southwards. We've been betrayed, Ezio heard Silvio say to Dante. The ship has sailed without us. God damn them! I've been nothing but loyal, and yet this, this is how they repay me. Let's use this boat to catch them up, said Dante. It's too late for that, and we'd never get to the island in a craft this size, but at least we can use it to get away from this catastrophe. Then let us cast off, Altezza. Indeed. Dante turned to the trembling crew. Cast off! Raise the sails! Look lively! At that moment, Ezio sprang from the shadows across the wharf and onto the boat. The frightened sailors made themselves scarce, diving into the murky lagoon. Get away from me, murderer! shrieked Silvio. You've delivered your last insult, said Ezio, stabbing him in the gut and drawing the blades of his double dagger slowly across his belly. And for what you said about my kinswomen, I'd cut your balls off with this if I thought it was worth it. Dante stood rooted to the spot. Ezio fixed him with his eye. The big man looked tired. It's over, Ezio told him. You backed the wrong horse. Maybe I did, said Dante. I'm going to kill you anyway, you filthy assassin. You make me tired. Ezio snapped out his pistola and fired. The slug hit Dante full in the face. He fell. Ezio knelt by Silvio to give him absolution. He was nothing if not conscientious, and always remembered that killing should only happen if there were no alternative, and that the dying, who very soon would have no rights at all, should at least be accorded the last rights. Where were you going, Silvio? What is that galley? I thought you sought the doge's seat. Silvio smiled thinly. That was just a distraction. We were meant to sail. Where? Too late, smiled Silvio, and died. Ezio turned to Dante and cradled the massive leonine head in the crook of his arm. Cyprus is their destination, Auditore, croaked Dante. I can perhaps redeem my soul at the last by telling you the truth. They want... They want... But choking on his own blood... The big man passed on. Ezio searched both men's wallets, but found nothing except a letter to Dante from his wife. Shamefacedly, he read it. Amore mio. 
I wonder if ever the day will come when these words might make sense to you once more. I'm sorry for what I have done, for allowing Marco to take me from you, divorce you, and make me his wife. But now that he has died, I may yet find a way for us to be joined again. I wonder, though, if you will even remember me. Or were the wounds you suffered in battle too grave? Do my words stir, if not your memory, then your heart? But perhaps it doesn't matter what they say, because I know you're still in my heart, somewhere. I will find a way, my love, to remind you, to restore you. Forever yours, Gloria. There was no address. Ezio folded the letter carefully and put it in his wallet. He would ask Theodora if she knew of this strange history, and if she could return the letter to its sender with news of the death of this faithless creature's true husband. He looked at the corpses and made the sign of the cross over them. Requiescat in pace, he said sadly. Ezio was still standing over the dead men when Bartolomeo came up, panting. So you didn't need my help, as usual, he said. Have you taken back the arsenal? Do you think I'd be here if we hadn't? Congratulations. Evviva! But Ezio was watching the sea. We've got Venice back, my friend, he said, and Agostino can rule it without further fear of the Templars. But I think there'll be little rest for me. Do you see that galley on the horizon? Yes. Dante told me with his dying breath that it is bound for Cyprus. To what end? That, amico, is what I need to find out. Chapter 21 Ezio could not believe it was Midsummer's Day in the year of Christ, 1487, his twenty-eighth birthday. He was by himself on the bridge of the fistfighters, leaning on the balustrade and gloomily looking at the dank water of the canal beneath him. As he watched, a rat swam by, pushing a cargo of cabbage leaves filched from the nearby greengrocer's barge towards a hole in the black brick of the canal's bank. There you are, Ezio, said a cheery voice, and he could smell Rosa's musky scent before he turned to greet her. It's been too long. I might almost think you've been avoiding me. I've been busy. <laughs> of course you have. What would Venice do without you? Ezio shook his head sadly, as Rosa leant comfortably on the balustrade beside him. Why so serious, Bello? she asked. Ezio gave her a deadpan look and shrugged. Happy birthday to me. It's your birthday? You serious? Wow! Rallegramenti! That's wonderful! I wouldn't go that far, sighed Ezio. It's been over ten years since I watched my father and brothers die. And I have spent ten years hunting down the men responsible, the men on my father's list, and those added to it since his death. And I know I am close to the end now, but I'm no closer to understanding what any of it has really been for. Ezio, you've dedicated your life to a good cause. It has made you lonely, isolated, but in one sense it has been your vocation. And though the instrument you have used to further your cause is death, you've never been unjust. Venice is a far better place now than it ever was because of you. So cheer up. Anyway, seeing as it's your birthday, here's a present. Very good timing as it happens. She took out an official-looking logbook. Thank you, Rosa. Not quite what I'd imagined you'd give me for my birthday. What is it? Just something I happened to pick up. It's the shipping manifest from the Arsenal. The date your black galley sailed for Cyprus late last year is entered in it. Seriously? Ezio reached for the book, but Rosa teasingly held it away from him. Give it to me, Rosa. This isn't a joke. Everything has its price, she whispered. If you say so. He held her in his arms for a long, lingering moment. She melted against him, and he quickly snatched the book away. Hey, that isn't fair, she laughed. Anyway, just to spare you the suspense, that galley of yours is scheduled to return to Venice tomorrow. 
What, I wonder, can they have on board? Why am I not surprised that someone not a million miles from here is going to find out? Ezio beamed. Let's go and celebrate first. But at that moment a familiar figure bustled up. Leonardo, said Ezio, greatly surprised. I thought you were in Milan. Just got back, replied Leonardo. They told me where to find you. Hello, Rosa. Sorry, Ezio, but we really need to talk. Now, this minute. Sorry. Rosa laughed. Go on, boys, have fun. I'll keep. Leonardo ushered a reluctant Ezio away. This had better be good, muttered Ezio. Oh, it is, it is, said Leonardo placatingly. He led Ezio along several narrow alleys until they arrived back at his workshop. Leonardo busied about, producing some warm wine and stale cakes, and a pile of documents which he dumped on a large trestle table in the middle of his study. I had your codex pages delivered to Monteregioni as promised, but I couldn't resist studying them some more myself, and I've copied out my findings. I don't know why I'd never made the connection before, but when I put them together I realized the markings and symbols and ancient alphabets can be decoded, and we seem to have struck gold, for all these pages are contiguous. He interrupted himself. This wine is too warm. Mind you, I've got used to San Colombano. This Veneto stuff is like gnat's piss by comparison. Go on, said Ezio patiently. Listen to this. Leonardo produced a pair of eyeglasses and perched them on his nose. He shuffled through his papers and read, The prophet will appear when the second piece is brought to the floating city. Ezio drew in his breath sharply at the words. Prophet, he repeated. Only the prophet may open it. Two pieces of Eden. Ezio? Leonardo looked quizzical, doffing his eyeglasses. What is it? Does this ring some kind of bell with you? Ezio looked at him. He appeared to be coming to some kind of decision. We've known each other a long time, Leonardo. If I can't trust you, there's nobody. Listen, my Uncle Mario spoke of it long ago. He's already deciphered other pages of this codex, as had my father, Giovanni. There's a prophecy hidden in it, a prophecy about a secret ancient vault which holds something, something very powerful. Really? That's amazing. But then a thought struck Leonardo. Look, Ezio, if we've found all this out from the Codex, how much do the Barbarigi and the others you've been pitched against know about it? Maybe they know about the existence of this vault you mentioned too, and if so, that's not good. Wait, said Ezio, his brain racing. What if that's why they sent the galley to Cyprus? To find this piece of Eden and bring it back to Venice? When the second piece is brought to the floating city, of course. It's coming back to me. The prophet will appear. Only the prophet can open the vault. My God, Leo, when my uncle told me about the codex, I was too young, too brash to imagine that it was anything but an old man's fantasy. But now I see it, plain. The murder of Giovanni Mocenigo, the killing of my kinsman, the attempt on the life of Duke Lorenzo, and the horrible death of his brother, it's all been part of his plan, to find the vault, the first name on my list, the one I have yet to strike a line through, the Spaniard. Leonardo breathed deeply. He knew whom Ezio was talking about. Rodrigo Borgia. His voice was a whisper. The same, Ezio paused. The Cyprus galley arrives tomorrow. I plan to be there to meet it. Leonardo embraced him. Good luck, my dear friend, he said. The following dawn found Ezio, armed with his codex weapons and a bandolier of throwing knives, standing in the shadows of the colonnade near the docks, watching closely as a group of men, dressed in plain uniforms to avoid attracting undue attention, but discreetly displaying the crest of Cardinal Rodrigo Borgia, unloaded a plain-looking, smallish crate from a black galley which had recently put in from Cyprus. They handled the crate with kid gloves, and one of their number, under guard, hoisted it onto his shoulder and prepared to set off with it. But then Ezio noticed that several other guards were hoisting similar crates onto their shoulders, five of them in all. Did each crate contain some precious artifact, 
the second piece, or were all but one of them decoys. And the guards all looked the same, certainly from the distance at which Ezio would be obliged to shadow them. Just as Ezio prepared to break cover and follow, he noticed another man watching what was going on from a similar vantage point to his own. He suppressed an involuntary gasp as he recognized this second man as his uncle, Mario Auditore. But there was no time to hail or challenge him, as the Borgia trooper carrying the crate had already moved off with his guard. Ezio pursued them at a safe distance. However, a question nagged him. Had the other man really been his uncle? And if so, how had he got to Venice, and why at this precise moment? But he had to put the notion away as he tailed the Borgia guards, concentrating hard to keep the one with the original crate in his line of sight, if that indeed were the one that contained, whatever it was, one of the pieces of Eden. The guards arrived at a square which had five streets leading off it. Each crate-carrying guard, with his escort, here set off in a different direction. Ezio swarmed up the side of a nearby building so that he could follow the course of each guard from the rooftops. Watching them keenly, he saw one of them leave his escort and turn into the courtyard of a solid-looking brick building, place his crate on the ground there, and open it. He was quickly joined by a Borgia sergeant. Ezio bounded over the roofs to hear what was being said between them. The master awaits, the sergeant was saying. Repackage it with care. Now. Ezio watched as the guard transferred an object wrapped carefully in straw from the crate to a teak box brought to him from the building by a servant. Ezio thought fast. The master. In his experience, when Templar minions mentioned that title, it could only refer to one man, Rodrigo Borgia. They were clearly repacking the true artifact in an attempt to double their security but now Ezio knew exactly which guard to target. He slipped down to street level again and cornered the trooper carrying the teak box. The sergeant had left to rejoin the escort of Cardinal's guards, waiting outside the courtyard. Ezio had a minute to slit the throat of the trooper, pull the body out of sight, and don his outer uniform, cape, and helmet. He was about to shoulder the box when the temptation to have a quick glance inside it overwhelmed him, and he lifted the lid, but at that moment the sergeant reappeared at the gateway of the courtyard. Get a move on. Yes, sir, said Ezio. Just look fucking lively. This is probably the most important thing you'll do in your life. Do you get me? Yes, sir. Ezio took his place at the centre of his escort, and the detail set off. They made their way through the city north from the Molo to the Campo dei Santi Giovanni e Paolo, where Messer Verrocchio's recent and massive equestrian statue of the Condottiero Colleone dominated the square. Following the Fondamenta dei Mendicanti north again, they arrived at last at a dull-looking house in a terrace overlooking the canal. The sergeant knocked on the door with the pommel of his sword, and it immediately swung open. The group of guards hustled Ezio in first, and followed, and a door closed behind them. Heavy bolts were shot across it. They were facing an ivy-festooned loggia in which a beak-nosed man in his mid to late fifties sat dressed in robes of dusty purple velvet. The men saluted. Ezio did so too, trying not to meet the icy, cobalt eyes he knew too well. The Spaniard. Rodrigo Borgia spoke to the sergeant. Is it really here? You were not followed. No, Altezza, everything went perfectly. Go on. The sergeant cleared his throat. We followed your orders exactly as specified. The mission to Cyprus was more difficult than we had anticipated. There were complications at the outset. Certain adherents to the cause had to be abandoned in the interests of our success. But we have returned with the artifact, and have transported it to you with all due care, as Su Altezza instructed. And according to our agreement, Altezza, we now look forward to being generously recompensed. Ezio knew that he could not allow the teak box and its contents to fall into the hands of the cardinal. At that moment, when the unpleasant but necessary subject of payment for services rendered had come up, 
and as usual the supplier had to nudge the client for the cash due for the special duties undertaken, Ezio grasped his opportunity. Like so many rich people, the cardinal could be miserly when the time came for handing over money. Unspringing the poison blade on his right forearm and the double-bladed dagger on his left, Ezio cut down the sergeant, a single stab to the man's exposed neck, enough to deliver the deadly venom to his bloodstream. Ezio quickly turned on the five guards of the escort, with his double dagger in one hand and the poison blade under his right wrist, spinning like a dervish, using quick, clinical movements to deliver single lethal blows. Moments later, all the guards lay dead at his feet. Rodrigo Borgia looked down at him, sighing heavily. Ezio Auditore. Well, well. It's been some time. The cardinal seemed completely unraffled. Cardinale. Ezio gave an ironic bow. Give it to me, said Rodrigo, indicating the box. Tell me first where he is. Where who is? Your prophet, Ezio looked around. It doesn't look as if anyone's shown up. He paused. More seriously, he continued. How many people have died for this? For what's in this box? And look, there's nobody here. Rodrigo chuckled. A sound like bones rattling. You claim not to be a believer, he said. And yet here you are. Do not see the prophet. He is already present. I am the prophet. Ezio's grey eyes widened. The man was possessed. But what curious madness was this, which seemed to transcend the rational and the natural courses of life itself? Alas, Ezio's pondering left him momentarily off guard. The Spaniard drew a schiavona, a light but deadly-looking sword, with a cat's head pommel, from his robes, and leapt from the lodger, aiming the thin sword at Ezio's throat. Give me the apple! he snarled. That's what's in this box, an apple. It must be a pretty special one, said Ezio, while in his mind his uncle's voice reverberated. A piece of Eden. Come and take it from me. Rodrigo sliced at Ezio with his blade, slashing his tunic and drawing blood at the first pass. Are you alone, Ezio? Where are your assassin friends now? I don't need their help to deal with you. Ezio used his daggers to cut and slash, and his left forearm guard brace to parry Rodrigo's blows. But though he landed no cut with the poison blade, his double blade stabbed through the velvet robe of the cardinal, and he saw it stained with the man's blood. You little shit, bellowed Rodrigo in pain. I can see that I'll need help to master you. Guards! Guards! Suddenly, a dozen armed men bearing the Borgia crest on their tunics stormed into the courtyard where Ezio and the cardinal were confronting one another. Ezio knew there was precious little poison left in the hilt of his right-hand dagger. He leapt back, the better to defend himself against Rodrigo's reinforcements, and at that moment one of the new guards stooped to sweep the teak box off the ground and hand it to his master. Thank you, a uomo coraggioso. Ezio, meanwhile, was seriously outmatched, but he fought with a strategic coldness born of an absolute desire to recapture the box and its contents. Sheathing his codex blades, he reached for his bandolier of throwing knives and shot them from his hands with deadly accuracy, first bringing down the uomo coraggioso, and then with a second knife, knocking the box from Rodrigo's gnarled hands. The Spaniard bent to pick it up again and make his retreat when, shoof, another throwing knife hurtled through the air to clatter against a stone column inches from the cardinal's face. But this knife had not been thrown by Ezio. Ezio whirled round to see a familiar, jovial, bearded figure behind him, older perhaps and greyer, and heavier, but no less deft. Uncle Mario, he exclaimed, I knew I'd seen you earlier. Can't let you have all the fun, said Mario. And don't worry, Nipote, you are not alone. But a Borgia guard was bearing down on Ezio, halberd raised. The moment before he could deliver the crushing blow which would have sent Ezio into an endless night, a crossbow bolt appeared as if by magic, buried in the man's forehead. 
He dropped his weapon and fell forwards, a look of disbelief etched on his face. Ezio looked round again and saw La Volpe. What are you doing here, Fox? We heard you might need some backup, said the Fox, reloading quickly as more guards began to pour out of the building. It was as well that more reinforcements in the shape of Antonio and Bartolomeo appeared on Ezio's side. Don't let Borgia get away with that box, yelled Antonio. Bartolomeo was using his great sword Bianca like a scythe, cutting a swathe through the ranks of guards as they tried to overpower him by sheer force of numbers. And gradually the tide of battle turned back in favour of the assassins and their allies. We've got them covered now, Nipote, called Mario. Look to the Spaniard. Ezio turned to see Rodrigo making for a doorway at the rear of the lodger and hastened to cut him off, but the cardinal, sword in hand, was ready for him. This is a losing battle for you, my boy, he snarled. You cannot stop what is written. You'll die by my hand like your father and your brothers, for death is the fate that awaits all who attempt to defy the Templars. Nevertheless, Rodrigo's voice lacked conviction, and looking round, Ezio saw that the last of his guards had fallen. He blocked Rodrigo's retreat at the threshold of the doorway, raising his own sword and preparing to strike, saying, This is for my father! But the cardinal ducked the blow, knocking Ezio off balance, yet dropping the precious box as he darted through the doorway to save his skin. Make no mistake, he said balefully as he left. I live to fight another day and then I'll make sure your death is as painful as it will be slow. And he was gone. Ezio, winded, was trying to catch his breath and struggled to his feet, when a woman's hand reached down to help him. Looking up, he saw that the owner of the hand was Paula. He's gone, she said, smiling. But it doesn't matter, we have what we came for. No, did you hear what he said? I must get after him and finish this. Calm yourself, said another woman, coming up. It was Theodora. Looking round the assembled company, Ezio could see all his allies. Mario, the fox, Antonio, Bartolomeo, Paola and Theodora. And there was someone else. A pale, dark-haired young man with a thoughtful, humorous face. What are you all doing here? asked Ezio, sensing a tension among them. Perhaps the same thing as you, Ezio, said the young stranger, hoping to see the prophet appear. Ezio was confused and irritated. No, I came here to kill the Spaniard. I couldn't care less about your prophet if he exists at all. He certainly isn't here. Isn't he? The young man paused, looking steadily at Ezio. You are? What? A prophet's arrival was foretold and here you have been among us for so long without our guessing the truth. All along, you were the one we sought. I don't understand. Who are you, anyway? The young man sketched a bow. My name is Niccolò di Bernardo dei Machiavelli. I am a member of the Order of the Assassins, trained in the ancient ways to safeguard the future of mankind, just like you just like every man and woman here. Ezio was astounded, looking from one face to the next. Is this true, Uncle Mario? he said at last. Yes, my boy, said Mario, stepping forward. We have all been guiding you for years, teaching you all the skills you'd need to join our ranks. Ezio's head filled with questions. He did not know where to begin. I must ask you for news of my family, he said to Mario. My mother, my sister. Mario smiled. You are right to do so. They are safe and well, and they are no longer at the convent, but at home with me at Monteregioni. Maria will always be touched by the sadness of her loss. But she has much to console herself with now, as she devotes herself to charitable work alongside the abbess. As for Claudia... The abbess could see long before she could herself that the life of a nun was not ideal for one of her temperament, and that there were other ways in which she might seek to serve our Lord. She was released from her vows. She married my senior captain, and soon, Ezio, 
she will present you with a nephew or niece of your own. Excellent news, uncle. I never quite liked the idea of Claudia spending her life in a convent. But I have so many more questions to ask you. There will be a time for questions soon, said Machiavelli. Much remains to be done before we can see our loved ones again and celebrate, said Mario. And it may be that we never will. We made Rodrigo abandon his box, but he will not rest until it is back in his possession. So we must guard it with our lives. Ezio looked around the circle of assassins, and noticed for the first time that each of them had a brand around the base of his or her left ring finger. But there was clearly no time for further questions now. Mario said to his associates, I think it is time. Gravely they nodded their assent, and Antonio took out a map and unfolded it, showing Ezio a point marked on it. Meet us here at sunset, he said, in a tone of solemn command. Come said Mario to the others. Machiavelli took charge of the box with its precious, mysterious contents, and the assassins filed silently out into the street and departed, leaving Ezio alone. Venice was eerily empty that evening, and the great square in front of the basilica was silent and unoccupied save for the pigeons which were its permanent denizens. The bell tower rose to a giddying height above Ezio's head as he began to climb it, but he did not hesitate. The meeting to which he'd been summoned would surely provide him with the answers to some of his questions, and though he knew in his heart of hearts that he would find some of the answers frightening, he also knew that he could not turn his back on them. As he approached the top, he could hear muted voices. At last he reached the stonework at the very top of the tower, and swung himself into the bell loft. A circular space had been cleared, and the seven assassins, all wearing cowls, were ranged around its perimeter, while a fire in a small brazier burned at its centre. Paola took him by the hand, and led him to the centre, as Mario began to utter an incantation. La shaya wakyun mutlak bale kulon mumkine these are the words spoken by our ancestors that lie at the heart of our creed. Machiavelli stepped forward and looked hard at Ezio. Where other men blindly follow the truth, remember. And Ezio picked up the rest of the words as if he had known them all his life. Nothing is true. Where other men are limited by morality or law, continued Machiavelli, remember. Everything is permitted. Machiavelli said, We work in the dark to serve the light. We are assassins. And the others joined in, intoning in unison, Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. When they had finished, Mario took Ezio's left hand. It is time, he told him. In this modern age we are not so literal as our ancestors. We do not demand the sacrifice of a finger, but the seal we mark ourselves with is permanent. He drew in his breath. Are you ready to join us? Ezio, as if in a dream, but somehow knowing what to do and what was to come, extended his hand unhesitatingly. I am, he said. Antonio moved to the brazier, and from it drew a red-hot branding iron ending in two small semicircles which could be brought together by means of a lever in the handle. Then he took Ezio's hand and isolated the ring finger. This only hurts for a while, brother, he said, like so many things. He inserted the branding iron over the finger and squeezed the red-hot metal semicircles together around its base. It seared the flesh, and there was a burning smell but Ezio did not flinch. Antonio quickly removed the branding iron and put it safely to one side. Then the assassins removed their hoods and gathered round him. Uncle Mario clapped him proudly on the back. Theodora produced a little glass file containing a clear, thick liquid, which she delicately rubbed on the ring burnt forever onto Ezio's finger. 
This will soothe it, she said. We are proud of you. Then Machiavelli stood in front of him and gave him a meaningful nod. Benvenuto, Ezio. You are one of us now. It only remains to conclude your initiation ceremony, and then, then, my friend, we have serious work to do. With that, he glanced over the edge of the bell tower. Far below, a number of bales of hay had been stacked a short distance away in various locations around the Campanile, horse fodder destined for the ducal palace. It seemed impossible to Ezio that from this height anyone could direct their fall accurately enough to land on one of those tiny targets, but that is what Machiavelli now did, his cloak flying in the wind as he leapt. His companions followed suit, and Ezio watched with a mixture of horror and admiration as each made perfect landings and then gathered, looking up at him with what he hoped were encouraging expressions on their faces. Used as he was to bounding over rooftops, he had never faced a leap of faith from such a height as this. The hay bales seemed the size of slices of polenta, but he knew that there was no other way for him to reach the ground again but this, and that the longer he hesitated, the harder it would be. He took two or three deep breaths, and then cast himself outwards and downwards into the night, arms aloft in a perfect swallow dive. The fall seemed to take hours, and the wind whistled past his ears, ruffling and shaking his clothing and his hair. Then the hay bales rushed up to meet him. At the last moment he shut his eyes and crashed down into the hay. All the breath was knocked from his body, but as he got shakily to his feet, he found that nothing was broken and that he was, in fact, elated. Mario came up to him, Theodora at his side. I think you'll do, don't you? Mario asked Theodora. The middle of that evening found Mario, Machiavelli and Ezio sitting around the big trestle table in Leonardo's workshop. The peculiar artifact which Rodrigo Borgia had set so much store by lay before them, and they all regarded it with curiosity and awe. It's fascinating, Leonardo was saying, absolutely fascinating. What is it, Leonardo? asked Ezio. What does it do? Leonardo said, Well, so far I'm stumped. It contains dark secrets, and its design is unlike anything I would guess ever seen on earth before. I've certainly never seen such sophisticated design. And I could no more explain this than explain to you why the earth goes round the sun. Surely you mean the sun goes round the earth, said Mario, giving Leonardo an odd look. But Leonardo continued to examine the machine, carefully turning it in his hands, and as he did so, it started to glow in response, with a ghostly, inner, self-generated light. It's made of materials that really shouldn't in all logic exist, Leonardo went on, wonderingly. And yet this is clearly a very ancient device. It's certainly referred to in the Codex pages we have, put in Mario. I recognize it from its description there. The Codex calls it a piece of Eden. And Rodrigo called it the apple, added Ezio. Leonardo looked at him sharply. As in the apple from the tree of knowledge. The apple Eve gave to Adam. They all turned to look at the object again. It had begun to glow more brightly and with a hypnotic effect. Ezio felt increasingly impelled, for reasons which he couldn't fathom, to reach out and touch it. He could feel no heat coming from it, and yet along with the fascination there came a sense of inherent danger, as if to touch it might send bolts of lightning through him. He was unaware of the others. It seemed as if the world around him had grown dark and cold, and nothing existed any more outside himself and this thing. He watched as his hand moved forwards as if it were no longer a part of him, as if he had no control over it and at last it placed itself firmly on the artifact's smooth side. The first reaction he had was one of shock. The apple looked metallic, but to the touch it was warm and soft, like a woman's skin, as if it were alive. But there was no time to ponder that, for his hand was thrown free, and the following instant the glow from within the device, which had been steadily getting brighter, 
suddenly burst into a blinding kaleidoscope of light and colour, within whose whirling chaos Ezio could make out forms. For a moment he wrenched his eyes from it to look at his companions. Mario and Machiavelli had turned away, their eyes screwed up, their hands covering their heads in fear or pain. Leonardo stood transfixed, eyes wide, mouth open in awe. Looking back, Ezio saw the forms begin to coalesce. A great garden appeared, filled with monstrous creatures. There was a dark city on fire, huge clouds in the shape of mushrooms and bigger than cathedrals or palaces. An army on the march, but an army unlike any Ezio had ever seen or even imagined could exist. Starving people in striped uniforms driven into brick buildings by men with whips and dogs. Tall chimneys belching smoke. Spiralling stars and planets. Men in weird armour rolling in the blackness of space. And there, too, was another Ezio, another Leonardo and Mario and Machiavelli, and more and more of them, the dupes of time itself, tumbling helplessly over and over in the air, the playthings of a mighty wind, which now indeed seemed to roar around the room they were in. Make it stop! someone bellowed. Ezio gritted his teeth, and without precisely knowing why, holding his right wrist in his left hand, forced his right hand back into contact with the thing. Instantly, it ceased. The room resumed its normal features and proportions. The men looked at each other. Not a hair was out of place. Leonardo's eyeglasses were still on his nose. The apple sat on the table inert, a plain little object that few would have given a second glance to. Leonardo was the first to speak. This must never fall into the wrong hands, he said. It would drive weaker minds insane. I agree, said Machiavelli. I could hardly stand it, hardly believe its power. Carefully, after putting on gloves, he picked up the apple and repacked it in its box, sealing the lid securely. Do you think the Spaniard knows what this thing does? Do you think he can control it? He must never have it, said Machiavelli in a voice of granite. He handed the box to Ezio. You must take charge of this and protect it with all the skills we have taught you. Ezio took the box carefully from him and nodded. Take it to Forli, Mario said. The citadel there is walled, protected by cannon, and it is in the hands of one of our greatest allies. And who is that? asked Ezio. Her name is Caterina Sforza. Ezio smiled. I remember now. An old acquaintance, and one which I shall be happy to renew. Then make your preparations to leave. I will accompany you, said Machiavelli. I shall be grateful for that, Ezio smiled. He turned to Leonardo. And what about you, amico mio? Me. When my work here is done, I'll return to Milan. The Duke there is good to me. You must come to Monteregioni, too, when you're next in Florence and have time, said Mario. Ezio looked at his best friend. Goodbye, Leonardo. I hope our paths cross again one day. I'm sure they will, said Leonardo. And if you need me, Agnolo in Florence will always know where to find me. Ezio embraced him. Farewell. A parting gift, said Leonardo, handing him a bag. Bullets and powder for your little pistola, and a nice big file of poison for that useful dagger of yours. I hope you won't need them, but it's important to me to know that you're as well protected as possible. Ezio looked at him with emotion. Thank you. Thank you for everything, my oldest friend. Chapter 22 after a long, uneventful journey by galley from Venice, Ezio and Machiavelli arrived at the wetlands port near Ravenna, where they were met by Caterina herself and some of her entourage. They sent me word by courier that you're on your way, so I thought I'd come down and accompany you back to Forli myself, she said. You were wise, I think, to make the journey in one of Doge Agostino's galleys, for the roads are often unsafe, and we have trouble with brigands. Not, I think, she added, casting an appreciative eye over Ezio, that they would have given you much trouble. 
I'm honoured that you remember me, Signora. Well, it has been a long time, but you certainly make an impression. She turned to Machiavelli. It's good to see you again, too, Niccolo. You two know each other, asked Ezio. Niccolo's been able to advise me on certain matters of state. She changed the subject. And now I hear that you've become a fully-fledged assassin. Congratulations. They'd arrived at Caterina's carriage, but she told her servants that she preferred to ride, it being a delightful day and the distance not great. The horses were duly saddled, and after they had mounted, Caterina bade Ezio ride beside her. You're going to love Forley, and you'll be safe there. Our cannon have protected the city well for over a century, and the citadel is all but impregnable. Forgive me, Signora, but there is one thing which intrigues me. Please tell me what it is. I've never heard of a woman ruling a city-state before. I'm impressed. Caterina smiled. Well, it was in my husband's hands before, of course. Do you remember him, a little? Girolamo? She paused. Well, he died. I'm so sorry. Don't be, she said simply. I had him assassinated. Ezio tried to conceal his amazement. It was like this, put in Machiavelli. We found out that Girolamo Riario was working for the Templars. He was in the process of completing a map which shows the locations of the remaining unretrieved codex pages. I never liked the goddamn son of a bitch anyway, said Caterina flatly. He was a lousy father, boring in bed, and a general all-round pain in the arse. She paused reflectively. Mind you, I've had a couple of other husbands since. Rather overrated, if you ask me. They were interrupted by the sight of a riderless horse coming towards them at the gallop. Caterina dispatched one of her outriders to go after it, and the rest of the party carried on towards Forley, but now the Sforza retainers had their swords drawn. Soon they came upon an overturned wagon, its wheels still spinning in the air, surrounded by dead bodies. Caterina's brow darkened, and she spurred her horse on, closely followed by Ezio and Machiavelli. A little further down the road they encountered a group of local peasants, some wounded, making their way towards them. "'What's going on?' Caterina accosted a woman at the head of the group. "'Altezza,' said the woman, tears pouring down her face. "'They came almost as soon as you had left. They're preparing to lay siege to the city. Who are?' The Orsi brothers, Madonna. Sangue di Giuda. Who are the Orsi? asked Ezio. The same bastards I hired to kill Girolamo, spat Caterina. The Orsi work for anyone who'll pay them, observed Machiavelli. They're not very bright, but unfortunately they have a reputation for getting a job done. He paused in thought. The Spaniard will be behind this. But how could he possibly know where we were taking the apple? They're not looking for the apple, Ezio. They're after Riario's map. The map is still in Forley. Rodrigo needs to know where the other codex pages are concealed, and we cannot afford to let him get his hands on the map. Never mind the map, cried Caterina. My children are in the city. Ah, porco demonio! They kicked their horses into a gallop until they came within sight of the town. Smoke was rising from within the walls, and they could see the city gates were closed. Men stood along the outer ramparts under the bare and bush crest of the Orsi family, but inside the town, the citadel on its hill still flew the flag of the Sforza. It looks as if they've gained control of at least part of Forley, but not the citadel, said Machiavelli. Double-crossing bastards, spat Caterina. Is there a way I can get into the city without their seeing me? asked Ezio, gathering up his codex weapons and strapping them on in readiness, keeping the gun and the spring blade in his satchel. There's a possibility, Caro, said Caterina, but it'll be hard. There's an old tunnel that leads under the western wall from the canal. Then I'll try, said Ezio. Be ready. If I can get the city gates open from the inside, be prepared to ride like hell. If we can reach the citadel and your people there see your crest and let you in, we'll be safe enough to plan the next move which will be to string these cretins up and watch them dangle in the wind, growled Caterina. But go on, Ezio, and good luck. I'll think of something to distract the Orsi troops' attention. Ezio dismounted and ran round to the western walls, keeping low and taking cover behind hillocks and bushes. Meanwhile, 
Katerina stood up in her stirrups and bawled at the enemy within the city walls. Hey, you! I'm talking to you, you spineless dogs! You occupy my city, my home, and you really think I'm going to do nothing about it? Why, I'm coming up there to rip off your coglioni, if you've got any, that is. Groups of soldiers had appeared on the ramparts now, looking across at Katerina, half amused, half intimidated, as she kept it up. What kind of men are you, doing the bidding of your paymasters for handfuls of loose change? I wonder if you'll think it was worth it after I've come up there, cut your heads off, pissed down your necks, and shoved your faces up my figa. I'll stick your balls on a fork and roast them over my kitchen fire. How does that sound? By now there were no men on watch along the western ramparts. Ezio found the canal unguarded, and, swimming down it, he located the overgrown entrance of the tunnel. Slipping out of the water, he plunged into the tunnel's black depths. It was well maintained inside, and dry, and all he had to do was follow it until he saw light at its other end. He approached it cautiously, and as he did so, Katerina's voice came to him again. The tunnel ended in a short flight of stone steps, which led up into a back room on the ground floor of one of the western towers of Forley. It was deserted. Katerina had collected quite a crowd. Through a window he could see most of the Orsi troops' backs as they watched and even occasionally applauded Katerina's performance. If I were a man I'd wipe those grins off your faces. But don't think I won't give it my best shot anyway. Don't be misled by the fact that I've got tits. A thought struck her. I bet you'd like to see them, wouldn't you? I bet you wish you could touch them, lick them, give them a squeeze. Well, why don't you come down here and try? I'd kick your balls so hard they'd fly out through your nostrils. L'uridi branco di cani bastardi. You'd better pack up and go home while you still can, if you don't want to be impaled and stuck up all along my citadel walls. Ah, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you'd actually enjoy having a long oaken pole up your asses. You disgust me. I even begin to wonder if you're worth the bother. I've never seen such a piss-poor shower of shite. Que vista penosa! I can't see that it would make much difference to you as men, even if I had you castrated. By now Ezio was in the street. He could see the gate closest to where Caterina and Machiavelli were located. At the top of its arch a bowman stood by the heavy lever which operated it. Moving as silently and as quickly as he could, he shinned up to the top of the arch and stabbed the soldier once in the neck, dispatching him instantly. Then he threw all his weight onto the lever, and the gates below swung open with a mighty groan. Machiavelli had been watching carefully all this time, and as soon as he saw the gates opening, he leant over and spoke softly to Caterina, who immediately spurred her horse forward at a frantic gallop, closely followed by Machiavelli and the rest of her entourage. As soon as they saw what was happening, the Orsi troops on the ramparts let out a yell of anger and started to swarm down to intercept, but the Sforza faction was too quick for them. Ezio seized the bow and arrows from the dead guard and used them to fell three Orsi men before he swiftly climbed a nearby wall and started to run over the city's rooftops, keeping pace with Caterina and her group as they rode through the narrow streets towards the citadel. The deeper they went into the city, the greater was the confusion that reigned. It was clear that the battle for control of Forley was far from over, as knots of soldiers under the banner of the Blue Snakes and Black Eagles of the Sforza fought the Orsi mercenaries, as ordinary citizens rushed for shelter in their houses, or simply ran aimlessly hither and yon in the confusion. Market stalls were overturned, chickens ran squawking underfoot, a small child sat in the mud and bawled for its mother, who ran out and snatched it to safety and all around the noise of battle roared. Ezio, leaping from roof to roof, could see something of the lie of the land from his vantage point, and used his arrows with deadly accuracy to protect Caterina and Machiavelli whenever Orsi guards got too close to them. At last they arrived in a broad piazza in front of the citadel. It was empty, and the streets leading off it appeared deserted. Ezio descended and rejoined his people. There was nobody on the citadel's battlements, and its massive gate was firmly closed. It looked every bit as impregnable as Katerina had said it was. She looked up and cried, Open up, you bloody parcel of fools! It's me, La Duquesa! Get your asses in gear! 
Now some of her men in the citadel did appear above them, among them a captain who said, Subito Altezza, and issued orders to three men who disappeared immediately to open the gate. But at that instant, howling for blood, dozens of Orsi troops poured from the surrounding streets into the square, blocking any retreat and pinning Katerina's company between them and the unforgiving wall of the citadel. Bloody ambush! shouted Machiavelli, with Ezio rallying their own handful of men and keeping between Katerina and their enemies. Aprite la porta! Aprite! yelled Katerina. And at last the mighty gates swung open. Sforza guards rushed out to aid them, and slashing at the Orsi in vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting, beat a retreat back through the gates, which quickly slammed shut behind them. Ezio and Machiavelli, who had quickly dismounted, both leaned against the wall, side by side and breathing hard. They could scarcely believe that they had made it. Caterina dismounted too, but didn't rest for an instant. Instead, she ran across the inner courtyard to a doorway in which two little boys and a wet nurse holding a baby were waiting fearfully. The children ran to her, and she embraced them, greeting them by name. Cesare, Giovanni, no preoccuparvi. She stroked the baby's head, cooing, Salute, Galeazzo. Then she looked around and at the wet nurse. Nezzetta, where are Bianca and Ottaviano? Forgive me, my lady. They were playing outside when the attack began, and we haven't been able to find them since. Caterina, looking frightened, was about to reply when suddenly a huge roar went up from the Orsi troops outside the citadel. The Sforza captain came rushing up to Ezio and Machiavelli. They're bringing in reinforcements from the mountains, he reported. I don't know how long we'll be able to hold out. He turned to a lieutenant. To the battlements! Man the cannon! The lieutenant rushed off to organize gun crews, and these were hurrying to their positions when a hail of arrows fired by Orsi archers started to descend on the inner courtyard and the ramparts above. Caterina hustled her younger children to safety, shouting to Ezio at the same time, Look after the cannon! They're our only hope! Don't let those bastards breach the citadel! Come, shouted Machiavelli. Ezio followed him up to where the cannon were ranged. Several of the gun crews were dead, along with the captain and the lieutenant. Others were wounded. The survivors were struggling to trim and angle the heavy cannon to bring them to bear on the Orsi men in the square below. Huge numbers of reinforcements had come up, and Ezio could see that they were man-handling siege engines and catapults through the streets. Meanwhile, directly below, a contingent of Orsi troops were bringing up a battering ram. If he and Machiavelli didn't think of something quickly, there would be no chance of saving the citadel. But to withstand this new assault, he would have to fire the cannon at targets within the walls of Forley itself, and so risk injuring or even killing some of its innocent citizens. Leaving Machiavelli to organize the gunners, he raced down to the courtyard and sought out Caterina. They are storming the city. To keep them at bay, I must fire the cannon at targets within its walls. She looked at him with steely calm. Then do what you must do. He looked up to the ramparts where Machiavelli stood, waiting for the signal. Ezio raised his arm and lowered it decisively. The cannon roared, and even as they did so, Ezio was flying back up to the ramparts where they were located. Directing the gunners to fire at will, he watched as first one siege engine and then another was blown to bits, as well as the catapults. There was little room for the Orsi troops to manoeuvre in the narrow streets, and after the cannon had wreaked their havoc, Sforza archers and crossbowmen began to pick off the surviving invaders within the city walls. At last, the remaining Orsi troops had been driven out of Forli altogether, and those Sforza troops who had survived outside the citadel itself were able to secure the outer curtain walls. But the victory had come at a cost. Several houses within the city were smouldering ruins, and in order to win it back, Caterina's gunners had not been able to avoid killing some of their own people. And there was something else to consider, as Machiavelli was quick to point out. They had flushed the enemy out of the city, but they had not raised the siege. Forley was still surrounded by Orsi battalions, cut off from supplies of fresh food and water, and Caterina's two older children were still out there somewhere, at risk. Some little time later, Caterina, Machiavelli and Ezio were standing on the ramparts of the outer walls, surveying the host encamped around them. Behind them, 
The citizens of Forley were doing their best to put the city back in order, but food and water wouldn't last forever, and everyone knew it. Katerina was haggard, worried to death about her missing children. Bianca, the older, was nine, and Ottaviano a year younger. They had yet to encounter the Orsi brothers themselves, but that very day a herald appeared at the centre of the enemy army and blew a clarion call. The troops parted like the sea to allow two men riding chestnut horses and dressed in chain-steel hauberks to pass between them, accompanied by pages bearing the crest of the bear and bush. They reined in well out of arrow range. One of the horsemen stood up in his stirrups and raised his voice. Katerina! Katerina Sforza! We think you're still cooped up in your dear little city, Katerina, so answer me. Katerina leant over the battlements, a wild expression on her face. What do you want? The man grinned broadly. Oh, nothing. I was just wondering if you were missing any children. Ezio had taken up a position at Katerina's side. The man who was speaking looked up at him in surprise. Well, well, he said. Ezio Auditore, if I am not mistaken. How pleasant to meet you. One has heard so much about you. And you, I take it, are the Fratelli Orsi, Ezio said. The one who had not yet spoken raised a hand. The same, Lodovico. And Cecco, said the other. At your service, he gave a dry laugh. Basta, cried Caterina. Enough of this. Where are my children? Let them go! Lodovico bowed ironically in the saddle. Ma certo, signora, we'll happily give them back, in exchange for something of yours, something, rather, that belonged to your late lamented husband, something he was working on on behalf of some friends of ours. His voice suddenly hardened. I mean a certain map. And a certain apple, too, added Cecco. Oh, yes, we know all about that. Do you think we are fools? Do you think our employer doesn't have spies? Yes, said Lodovico. We'll have the apple, too. Or shall I slice your little one's throats from ear to ear and send them to join their papa? Katerina stood listening. Her mood had changed to one of icy calm. When her turn came to speak, she cried, Bastardi! You think you can intimidate me with your vulgar threats? You scum! I'll give you nothing. You want my children? Take them. I have the means to make more. And she raised her skirts to show them her vagina. I'm not interested in your histrionics, Katerina, said Cecco, wheeling his horse around. And I'm not interested in staring at your figure, either. You'll change your mind, but we're only giving you an hour. Your brats will be safe enough until then in that slummy little village of yours just down the road. And don't forget, we will kill them, and then we will come back and smash your city and take what we want by force. So you just take advantage of our generosity and we can all save ourselves a lot of bother. And the brothers rode off. Katerina collapsed against the rough wall of the rampart, breathing heavily through her mouth, in shock at what she'd just said and done. Ezio was by her side. You're not going to sacrifice your children, Katerina. No cause could ever be worth that. To save the world? She looked at him, lips parted, pale blue eyes wide under her mane of red hair. We cannot become people like them, said Ezio simply. There are some compromises which cannot be made. Oh, Ezio, that is what I expected you to say. She flung her arms round his neck. Of course we can't sacrifice them, my darling. She stood back. But I cannot ask you to take the risk of getting them back for me. Try me, said Ezio. He turned to Machiavelli. I won't be gone long, I hope. But whatever happens to me, I know you will guard the apple with your life. And Caterina? Yes? Do you know where Girolamo hid the map? I'll find it. Do so, and protect it. And what will you do about the Orsi? asked Machiavelli. They are already added to my list, said Ezio. They belong to the company of men who killed my kinsmen and destroyed my family. But I now see that there is a greater cause to be served than mere revenge. 
the two men shook hands and their eyes locked. Buona fortuna, amico mio, said Machiavelli sternly. Buona fortuna anche. It wasn't hard to reach the village whose identity Cecco had so carelessly given away, even if his description of it as a slum had been a little ungracious. It was small and poor, like most serf villages in the Romagna, and it showed signs of having recently been flooded by its nearby river, but on the whole it was neat and clean, the houses roughly whitewashed and the thatch new. Although the waterlogged road that divided the dozen or so houses was still mired from the flood, everything suggested order, if not contentment, and industry, if not happiness. The only thing which distinguished Santa Salvazza from a peacetime village was that it was peppered with Orsi men-at-arms. No wonder, mused Ezio, that Cecco thought he could afford to mention where he was holding Bianca and Ottaviano. The next question was, where exactly in the village might Caterina's children be located? Ezio, having armed himself this time with the double blade on his left forearm with his metal arm guard, and the pistola on his right, as well as a light arming sword hung from his belt, was dressed simply in a peasant's woollen cloak which hung down below his knees. He pulled his hood up to avoid recognition, and, dismounting some way outside the village and keeping a weather eye out for Orsi scouts, he slung a fardel of kindling borrowed from an outhouse onto his back. Stooping beneath it, he made his way into Santa Salvazza. The residents of the village tried to go about their business as they normally did, despite the military presence that had been foisted onto them. Naturally, no one was particularly enamoured of the Orsi mercenaries, and Ezio, unnoticed by the latter but almost instantly recognised as a stranger by the locals, was able to gain their support in his mission. He made his way to a house at the end of the village, larger than the others and set slightly apart. It was there, he'd been told by an old woman carrying water from the river, that one of the children was being held. Ezio was grateful that the Orsi soldiery was pretty thinly spread. Most of the force were busy laying siege to Forley. But he knew he had very little time to rescue the children. The door and windows of the house were firmly shut, but as he made his way round the back, where two wings of the building formed a courtyard, Ezio heard a young, firm voice delivering a severe lecture. He climbed onto the roof and peered down into the courtyard, where Bianca Sforza, the miniature image of her mother, was giving two surly Aussie guardsmen a dressing down. "'Are you two sorry-looking specimens all they could rustle up to guard me?' she was saying regally, drawn up to her full height and showing as little fear as her mother would have done. "'Stolti! It won't be enough. My mamma is fierce and would never let you hurt me. We Sforza women are no shrinking violets, you know. We may look pretty to the eye, but the eyes deceive, as my papa found out.' She drew breath, and the guards looked at each other nonplussed. I hope you don't imagine I'm scared of you either, because if you did, you'd be very much mistaken. And if you touch one hair of my little brother's head, my mamma will hunt you down and eat you for breakfast, capito? Just button it, you little fool, growled the older of the guards, unless you want to clip round the ear. Don't you dare talk to me like that. In any case, it's absurd. You'll never get away with this, and I'll be safe at home within the hour. In fact, I'm getting bored. I'm surprised you don't have anything better to do while I wait for you to die. All right, that's quite enough, said the older guard, reaching out to grab her. But at that moment Ezio fired his pistola from the rooftop, hitting the soldier squarely in the chest. The man was launched from his feet, crimson blossoming through his tunic even before he hit the ground. Ezio mused for a second that Leonardo's powder mix must be improving. In the flurry of confusion that followed the guard's sudden death, Ezio leapt down from the rooftop, landing with the grace and power of a panther, and with his double blades quickly rounded on the younger guard, who fumbled in drawing an ugly-looking dagger. Ezio slashed precisely at the man's forearm, shearing through tendons as though they were ribbons. The man's dagger dropped to the ground, sticking point-first in the mud, and before he could muster any further defence, Ezio had brought the double blade under his jaw, stabbing through the soft tissue of the mouth and tongue into the cavity of the skull. Ezio calmly withdrew the blades, leaving the corpse to slump to the ground. Are they the only two? he asked the undismayed Bianca as he quickly reloaded. 
Yes, and thank you, whoever you are. My mother will see that you are amply rewarded. But they've got my brother Ottaviano, too. Do you know where he is? asked Ezio, swiftly reloading his pistol. They've got him in the watchtower, by the ruined bridge. We must hurry. Show me where, and stay very close. He followed her out of the house and along the road until they came upon the tower. They were just in time, for there was Lodovico himself, dragging the whimpering Ottaviano along by the scruff of his neck. Ezio could see that the little boy was limping. He must have twisted his ankle. You! shouted Lodovico when he saw Ezio. You'd better hand the girl over and go back to your mistress. Tell her we'll finish the pair of them if we don't get what we want. I want my mamma, bawled Ottaviano. Let me go, you big thug. Shut up, Marmocchio, Lodovico snarled at him. Ezio, go fetch the apple and the map, or the kid gets it. I need to pee, wailed Ottaviano. Oh, for God's sake, chiudi il becco. Let him go, said Ezio firmly. I'd like to see you make me. You'll never get close enough, you fool. The minute you make a move, I'll slit his throat as easily as winking. Lodovico had dragged the little boy in front of him with both hands, but now had to free one hand in order to draw his sword. At that moment, Ottaviano tried to break free, but Lodovico grasped him firmly by the wrist. Nevertheless, Ottaviano was no longer between Lodovico and Ezio. Seeing his opportunity, Ezio sprang out his pistol and fired. Lodovico's enraged expression was transformed to one of disbelief. The ball had hit him in the neck, cutting the jugular. His eyes goggling, he let go of Ottaviano and sank to his knees, clutching his throat, the blood seeping through his fingers. The boy ran forward to be embraced by his sister. Ottaviano, stai bene, she said, hugging him close. Ezio moved forward to stand over Lodovico, but not too close. The man hadn't fallen yet, and his sword was still in his hand. Blood oozed down onto his jerkin, a trickle becoming a torrent. I don't know what devil's instrument has given you the means to get the better of me, Ezio, he panted. But I'm sorry to tell you that you will lose this game whatever you do. We all see are not the fools you seem to take us for. If anyone is a fool, you are. You and Katerina. You are the fool said Ezio, his voice cold with scorn, to die for a bag full of silver. Do you really think it was worth it? Lodovico grimaced. More than you know, friend. You've been outwitted, and whatever you do now, the master will gain his prize. His face contorted in agony at the pain from his wound. The bloodstain had spread. You'd better finish me, Ezio, if you have any mercy in you at all. Then die with your pride, Orsi. It means nothing. Ezio stepped forward and further opened the wound in Lodovico's neck. An instant later, he was no more. Ezio stooped over him and closed his eyes. Requiescat in pace, he said. But there was no time to be lost. He returned to the children, who had been watching wide-eyed. Can you walk? he asked Ottaviano. I'll try, but it hurts terribly. Ezio knelt and looked. The ankle wasn't twisted, but sprained. He lifted Ottaviano onto his shoulders. Courage, little Duce, he said. I'll get you both home safe. Can I have a pee first? I really do need to. Be quick. Ezio knew it wouldn't be an easy matter to get the children back through the village. It was impossible to disguise them as they were gorgeously dressed, and in any case by now Bianca's escape would surely have been discovered. He exchanged the gun on his wrist for the poison blade, putting the wrist mechanism in his pack. Taking Bianca's right hand in his left, he made for the woods that skirted the western side of the village. Climbing a low hill, he was able to look down on Santa Salvazza and saw Orsi troops running in the direction of the watchtower, but none seemed to have deployed in the woods. Grateful for the respite, and after what seemed an age, he arrived with the children back where he had tethered his horse placed them on its back, and got up behind them. Then he rode back north to Forley. The city looked quiet. Too quiet. And where were the Orsi forces? Had they raised the siege? It didn't seem possible. 
he spurred his horse on. Take the southern bridge, Messere, said Bianca, in front, holding on to the saddle's pommel. It's the most direct way home from here. Ottaviano nestled against him. As they approached the walls of the town, he saw the southern gates open. Out came a small troop of Sforza guards escorting Caterina and, close behind her, Machiavelli. Ezio could see at once that his fellow assassin had been wounded. He urged his mount forwards, and when he reached the others, swiftly dismounted and passed the children into Caterina's waiting arms. What in the name of the Blessed Virgin is going on? he asked, looking from Caterina to Machiavelli, and back again. What are you doing out here? Oh, Ezio, said Caterina. I'm so sorry. So sorry. What's happened? The whole thing was a trick, to lower our defences, Caterina said despairingly. Taking the children was a diversion. Ezio turned his glance back to Machiavelli. But the city is safe, he said. Machiavelli sighed. Yes, the city is safe. The Orsi no longer have an interest in it. What do you mean? After we'd driven them out, we relaxed, only momentarily to regroup and see to our wounded. It was then that Cecco counter-attacked. They must have planned the whole thing. He stormed the city. I fought him man to man and hard, but his soldiers came on me from behind and overwhelmed me. Ezio, now I must ask you to show courage, for Cecco has taken the apple. Ezio was stunned for a long moment. Then he said slowly, What? No, that cannot be. He looked around wildly. Where has he gone? As soon as he had what he wanted, he beat a retreat with his men, and the army split up. We couldn't see which group had the apple, and we were too battle-weary to give effective chase anyway. But Cecco himself led a company into the mountains to the west. Then all is lost, Ezio cried, thinking that Lodovico had been right. He had underestimated the Orsi. We still have the map, thank God, said Caterina. He didn't dare spend too much time searching for it. But what if, now he has the apple, he no longer needs the map? The Templars cannot be allowed to triumph, said Machiavelli grimly. They cannot. We must go. But Ezio could see that his friend had turned grey from his wounds. No, you stay here. Caterina, tend to him. I must leave now. There may yet be time. Chapter 23 it took a long time for Ezio, riding by day and taking what little rest he could when changing his horse, to arrive in the Apennines, and when he did, he knew the search for Cecco Orsi would take him even longer. But he also knew that if Cecco had returned to his family's seat at Nubilaria, he would be able to cut him off on the road that led from there south on the long, winding route it took to Rome. There was no guarantee that Cecco wouldn't have gone directly to the Holy See. But Ezio thought that with such a precious cargo as the apple, his adversary would first seek safety where he was known, and from there send couriers to establish whether the Spaniard had returned to the Vatican before making contact with him there. Ezio therefore decided to take the Nubilaria road himself, and, entering the town in secret, set about discovering what he could about Cecco's whereabouts. But Cecco's own spies were everywhere and it wasn't long before Ezio learned that Cecco was aware that he was closing in and was planning to take off in a caravan of two carriages with the apple in order to escape from him and foil his plans. On the morning Cecco planned to depart, Ezio was ready, keeping a close watch on the southern gates of Nubilaria, and soon the two carriages he'd been expecting rumbled out through them. Ezio mounted his horse to give chase, but at the last moment a third, lighter carriage, driven by an Orsi henchman, came fast out of a side street and deliberately blocked Ezio's path, causing his horse to rear and throw him. With no time to waste, Ezio was obliged to abandon his steed and, jumping up, clambered onto the Orsi carriage, felling its driver with a single blow and throwing him to the ground. He whipped up the horses and gave chase. It wasn't long before he had his adversary's vehicles in sight, but they saw him too and increased their speed. As they pelted down the treacherous mountain road, Cecco's escort carriage, filled with Orsi soldiers who were preparing to fire their crossbows at Ezio, 
took a corner too fast. The horses broke their traces and raced on round the bend ahead, but the carriage, its steering gear gone and its hafts empty, shot straight on over the edge of the road and crashed hundreds of feet into the valley below. Under his breath, Ezio thanked fate for her kindness. He urged his own horses on, worried that he would drive them too hard and cause their hearts to burst, but they were pulling less weight than the animals pulling Cecco's carriage and steadily made up the distance that separated Ezio from his quarry. As Ezio drew level, the Orsi coachman struck out at him with his whip, but Ezio caught it in his hand and pulled it free. Then, when the right moment came, he let go of his own reins and leapt from his carriage to the roof of Cecco's. In panic, the horses of his carriage, relieved of both the weight and the control of a driver, bolted and careered out of sight down the road ahead of them. Get the hell off, yelled Cecco's driver, alarmed. What in God's name do you think you're doing? Are you crazy? But without his whip, he was finding it harder to control his own team of horses. He had no leisure to fight. From inside the carriage, Cecco himself was shouting, Don't be a fool, Ezio! You'll never get out of this! Leaning half out of the window, he lunged at Ezio with his sword, while the coachman frantically tried to control the horses. Get off my carriage, now! The driver tried deliberately swerving the carriage to throw Ezio off, but he clung on for dear life. The carriage veered dangerously, and at last, as they were passing a disused marble quarry, it ran completely out of control, crashing onto its side and throwing the driver heavily onto a pile of slabs of marble of all sizes that had been sawn out by the masons and then abandoned owing to faults that ran through the stone. The horses were pulled down in their traces, pawing the ground in frantic terror. Ezio jumped clear, landed in a crouch, and had his sword out ready for Cecco, who, winded but unhurt, was clambering out, fury in his face. Give me the apple, Cecco. It's all over. Imbecile! It'll be over when you're dead! Cecco swung his sword at his opponent, and immediately they were cutting and slashing at each other, dangerously close to the edge of the road. Give me the apple, Cecco, and I'll let you go. You have no idea of the power of what you have. You'll never have it. And when my master does, he will have undreamed of power, and Lodovico and I will be there to enjoy our share of it. Lodovico is dead. And do you really think your master will let you live once your usefulness to him is over? You already know too much. You killed my brother. Then this is for you, for his sake. Cecco rushed at him. They closed, blades flashing and Cecco struck at Ezio again, his sword deflected by the metal arm guard. The fact that his well-aimed blow had not struck home momentarily put Cecco off his guard, but he quickly recovered and struck a blow at Ezio's right arm, cutting deeply into his bicep and causing him to let his weapon fall. Cecco gave a hoarse cry of triumph. He held the point of his sword at Ezio's throat. Don't beg for mercy, he said, for I'll give you none and he drew back his arm to drive in the fatal blow. At that instant, Ezio unleashed the double-bladed dagger from its mechanism on his left forearm and, swinging round with lightning speed, rammed it into Cecco's chest. Cecco stood stock still for a long moment, looking down at the blood dripping onto the white roadway. He dropped his sword and fell against Ezio, clutching onto him for support. Their faces were close. Cecco smiled. So, you have your prize again, he whispered, as the lifeblood pumped out faster from his chest. Was it really worth it? asked Ezio. So much carnage. The man gave what sounded like a chuckle, or it might have been a cough, as more blood flooded his mouth. Look, Ezio, you know how hard it will be for you to hold on to a thing of such value for long. He fought for breath. I am dying today but it will be you who dies tomorrow. And as the expression faded from his face, and his eyes rolled upwards, his body sank to the ground at Ezio's feet. We shall see, my friend, Ezio told him. Rest in peace. He felt groggy. Blood was pouring from the wound in his arm, but he made himself walk to the carriage and calmed the horses, cutting them free of their traces. Then he searched the interior and quickly located the teak box. Opening it quickly to ensure that its contents were safe, 
he reclasped it shut again and tucked it firmly under his good arm. He glanced across the quarry, where the driver lay inert. It wasn't necessary to verify that the man was dead, for the broken angle of the body told him everything. The horses had not moved far, and Ezio went over to them, wondering if he had the strength to mount one and use it at least to get him part of the way back to Forley. He hoped he would find everything there as he had left it, for his tracing of Cecco had taken far longer than he'd hoped or expected. But he had never pretended that his work would be easy, and the apple was back in assassin control. The time he had spent had not been in vain. He looked at the horses again, deciding that the lead beast would be his best choice of the four. He went to put his hand on its mane to pull himself up, for it was not equipped with riding tack, but as he did so, he staggered. He had lost more blood than he'd thought. He would have to bind up his wound somehow before he did anything else. He tethered the horse to a tree and cut a strip from Cecco's shirt to use as a bandage. Then he dragged the body out of sight. If anyone came by, they would assume, if they did not look too carefully, that Ezio and the driver had been the victims of a tragic road accident. But it was getting late, and there would be few travellers abroad at this hour. However, the effort drained the last of his resources. Even I have to rest, he thought, and the thought was a sweet one. He sat down in the shade of the tree and listened to the sound of the horse as it gently grazed. He placed the teak box on the ground beside him and took one last cautious look round, for this was the last place he should remain for long, but his eyelids were heavy and he did not see the silent watcher concealed by a tree on the knoll which rose above the road behind him. When Ezio awoke, darkness had fallen, but there was just enough moonlight for him to see a figure moving silently near him. Ezio's right bicep ached dully, but when he tried to raise himself with his good left arm, he found he could not move it. Someone had brought a slab of marble from the quarry, and used it to pin the arm down. He struggled, using his legs to try to stand, but he could not. He looked down to where he had left the box containing the apple. It was gone. The figure who was dressed, Ezio saw, in the black cappa and white habit of a Dominican monk, had noticed him wake, and turned to him, adjusting the marble slab so that it held him more securely. Ezio noticed that a finger was missing from one of the monk's hands. Wait, he said. Who are you? What are you doing? The monk didn't reply. Ezio could see the box as the monk stooped to pick it up again. Don't touch that. Whatever you do, don't... But the monk opened the box, and a light as bright as the sun shone forth. Ezio thought he heard the monk give a sigh of satisfaction, before he passed out again. When he woke again, it was morning. The horses were all gone, but with daylight some of his strength had returned. He looked at the marble slab. It felt heavy, but it did move slightly when his arm moved under it. He looked around. Just within reach of his right hand he could see a stout branch that must have fallen from the tree at some point in the past, but which was still green enough to be strong. Gritting his teeth, he picked it up and manoeuvred it under the slab. His right arm hurt like hell and started to bleed again as he wedged one end of the branch under the slab and heaved. A half-forgotten line from his school days had flashed through his mind. Give me a lever long enough and I will lift the earth. He pushed hard. The slab started to move, but then his strength failed him and it fell back into place again. He lay back rested, and tried again. At the third attempt, screaming inwardly with pain, and thinking the muscles of his wounded right arm would tear through the skin, he pushed again, as if his very life depended on it, and finally the slab rolled over onto the ground. Gingerly he sat up. His left arm was sore, but nothing was broken. Why the monk had not killed him as he slept he had no idea. Perhaps murder was not part of the man of God's plan. But one thing was certain. The Dominican and the apple 
were gone. Dragging himself to his feet, he found his way to a nearby stream and drank thirstily before bathing his wound and redressing it. Then he set off eastwards back over the mountains towards Forley. At last, after a journey of many days, he saw the towers of the town in the distance. But he was tired, drained by his unremitting task, by his failure, by his loneliness. On the journey back, he had had plenty of time to think about Christina and what might have been, had he not been given this cross to bear. But since he had, he could not change his life, nor, as he realised, would he. He had reached the far end of the bridge to the southern gate, and was close enough to see people on the battlements, when exhaustion finally overcame him, and he passed out. When he next awoke, it was to find himself lying in a bed covered in pristine linen sheets, out on a sunny terrace shaded by vines. A cool hand stroked his forehead, and pressed a beaker of water to his lips. Ezio, thank God you are back with us. Are you all right? What happened to you? The questions flowed from Katerina's mouth with all her usual impetuosity. I... I don't know. They saw you from the ramparts. I came out personally. You'd been travelling for I don't know how long, and you have a horrific wound. Ezio struggled with his memory. Something is coming back to me now. I had retrieved the apple from Checo. But there was another man who came soon afterwards. He took the apple. Who? He wore a black hood like a monk, and I think had a finger missing. Ezio struggled to sit up. How long have I been lying here? I have to go, right away. He started to rise, but it was as if his limbs were made of lead, and as he moved, a terrible dizziness overcame him, so he was obliged to lie back again. Oh, what did that monk do to me? Katerina leaned over him. You can't go anywhere yet, Ezio. Even you need time to recover if you are to fight the battles well which lie ahead. And I can see a long and arduous journey in front of you. But cheer up. Niccolo has returned to Florence. He will look after the matters there. And your other fellow assassins are vigilant, so stay a while. She kissed his forehead, then, tentatively at first, his lips. And if there is anything I can do to... Hasten your recovery. You have only to say the word. Her hand began very gently to wander downwards beneath the sheets until she found her objective. Wow, she smiled. I think I am already succeeding, a little. You are quite a woman, Katerina Sforza. She laughed. Tesoro, if ever I were to write the story of my life, I would shock the world. Ezio was strong and still, at thirty years old, a young man in his prime. Moreover, he had undergone some of the toughest training known to man, so it was really no wonder that he was up and about again sooner than most would have been. But his right arm had been severely weakened by Cecco's blow, and he knew he needed to work hard to recover the full strength he required to resume his quest. He made himself be patient, and under Caterina's strict but understanding guidance, spent his enforced time at Forley in quiet contemplation, when he could often be found sitting under the vines lost in one of Poliziano's books, or, more frequently, in vigorous exercise of every kind. And then a morning came when Caterina arrived in his chamber to find him dressed for travel and a page helping him pull on his riding boots. She sat on the bed beside him. So the time has come, she said. Yes. I can delay no longer. She looked sad and left the room, to return not long afterwards with a scroll. Well, the time had to come, she said, and God knows your task is more important than our enjoyment, for which I hope another time will come round again soon. She showed him the scroll. Here, I have brought you a leaving present. What is it? Something you will need. She unrolled it and Ezio saw that it was a map of the entire peninsula, from Lombardy to Calabria, and all across it, as well as the roads and towns, a number of crosses were marked on it, in red ink. Ezio looked up at her. 
It's the map Machiavelli spoke of. Your husband's, my late husband's, mio caro. Niccolo and I made a couple of important discoveries while you were on your travels. The first is that we timed our removal of dear Girolamo rather well, for he just about completed his work on this. The second is that it is of inestimable value, for even if the Templars have the apple, they cannot hope to find the vault without the map. You know about the vault? Darling, you can be just a tad naive at times. Of course I do. She became more businesslike. But fully to disarm our enemies, you must recover the apple. This map will help you bring your full great task to an end. As she handed him the map, their fingers touched, lingered, and entwined. And their eyes would not leave each other's. There is an abbey in the wetlands near here, Katerina said at last. Dominicans. Their order wears black hoods. I'd start there. Her eyes were shining, and she looked away. Now go. Find us that troublesome monk. Ezio smiled. I think I'm going to miss you, Katerina. She smiled back a bit too brightly. For once in her life, she was finding it hard to be brave. Oh, I know you will. Chapter 24 The monk who welcomed Ezio at the Wetlands Abbey was as monks should be, plump and rubicund, but he had flaming red hair and puckish, shrewd eyes, and spoke with an accent Ezio recognised from some of the condottieri he'd encountered in Mario's service. The man was from Ireland. Blessings on you, brother. Grazie, padre. I am Brother O'Callaghan. I wonder if you can help me. That's why we're here, brother. Of course, we live in troubled times. It's hard to think straight without something in our stomachs. You mean something in your coin purse? You take me wrong. I'm not asking you for anything. The monk spread his hands. But the Lord helps the generous. Ezio shook out some florins and passed them across. If it's not enough. The monk looked reflective. Ah, well, the thought is there. But the truth is that the Lord actually helps the slightly more generous. Ezio continued shaking out coins until Brother O'Callaghan's expression cleared. The Order appreciates your open-handedness, brother. He folded his hands on his belly. What do you seek? A black-hooded monk who lacks one of his ten fingers. Hmm. Brother Guido has only nine toes. Are you sure it wasn't a toe? Quite sure. And then there's Brother Domenico. But it's his entire left arm he's lacking. No, I'm sorry, but I'm quite sure it was a finger. Hmm. The monk paused, deep in thought. Now wait a moment. I do recall a black-cowled monk with only nine fingers. Yes, of course. It was when we had our last San Vicenzo's feast at our abbey in Tuscany. Ezio smiled. Yes, I know the place. I'll try there. Grazie. Go in peace, brother. I always do. Ezio crossed the mountains westwards into Tuscany, and though the journey was a long and difficult one, as autumn approached and the days became unkinder, he felt his greatest trepidation when he approached the abbey for it was the place where one of those implicated in the plot to assassinate Lorenzo de' Medici, Jacopo de' Pazzi's secretary, Stefano de' Bagnoni, had met his end at Ezio's hands long ago. It was unfortunate that the abbot who greeted him here was one who had been a witness to that killing. Excuse me, Ezio said to him first. I wonder if you can... But the abbot, recognising him, drew back in horror and cried, May all the archangels... Uriel, Raphael, Michael, Sarakel, Gabriel, Ramil, and Raguel, may they all in their mightiness protect us. He turned his blazing eyes from heaven to Ezio. Unholy demon, be gone! What's the matter? said Ezio in consternation. What's the matter? What's the matter? You are the one who murdered Brother Stefano, on this holy ground. A nervous group of brothers had gathered at a safe distance, and the abbot now turned to them. He has returned! The killer of monks and priests has returned! 
he pronounced in a voice of thunder, and then took flight, followed by his flock. The man was clearly in a state of high panic. Ezio had no choice but to give chase. The abbey was not as familiar to him as to the abbot and his troop of monks. At last he tired of hurtling round unfamiliar stone corridors and cloisters, and leapt to the rooftops to get a better view of where the monks were headed, but this only threw them into a greater panic, and they started to scream, He's come! He's come! Beelzebub has come! And so he desisted and stuck to conventional means of pursuit. Finally he caught up with them. Panting, the abbot rounded on him and croaked, Be gone, demon! Leave us alone! We have done no sin so great as thine. No, wait, listen, panted Ezio, almost equally out of breath. I just want to ask you a question. We have called down no demons upon us. We seek no journey to the afterlife just yet. Ezio placed his palms downwards. Please, calma. I wish you no harm. But the abbot wasn't listening. He rolled his eyes. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm not yet ready to join your angels. And he took to his heels again. Ezio was obliged to bring him down in an arms-to-feet tackle. They both got up, dusting themselves down in the middle of a circle of goggling monks. Stop running away, please, pleaded Ezio. The abbot cowered. No, have mercy, I don't want to die, he burbled. Ezio, conscious that he was sounding prim, said, Look, Father Abbot, I only kill those who kill others. And your brother Stefano was a killer. He tried to murder Duke Lorenzo in 1478. He paused, breathing heavily. Be reassured, Messer Abate, I am certain you are no such thing as a murderer. The abbot's look became a trace calmer, but there was still suspicion in his eyes. What do you want, then? he said. All right now, listen to me. I'm looking for a monk dressed like you are. A Dominican, who is missing a finger. The abbot looked wary. Missing a finger, do you say? Like Fra Savonarola? Ezio seized on the name. Savonarola? Who is he? Do you know him? I did, Messer. He was one of us, for a time. And then? The abbot shrugged. We suggested he take a nice long rest at a hermitage in the mountains. He didn't quite fit in here. It seems to me, Abate, that his time as a hermit may be over. Do you know where he may have gone now? Oh, dear me, the abbot searched his mind. If he's left the hermitage, it may be that he has returned to Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence. It's where he studied. Perhaps that's where he'd go back to. Ezio breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you, abbot. Go with God. It was strange for Ezio to be in his hometown again after so long. There were many memories to deal with. But circumstances dictated that he work alone. He could not contact even old friends or allies, lest the enemy were alerted. It was also clear that even if the city remained stable, the church at least which he sought was in turmoil. A monk came running from it in fear. He accosted the monk. Whoa there, brother, it's all right. The monk looked at him wild-eyed. Stay away, my friend, if you value your life. What's happened here? Soldiers from Rome have seized our church. They've scattered my brothers, asking questions that make no sense. They keep demanding that we give them fruit. What kind of fruit? Apples. Apples? Diavolo, Rodrigo has got here before me, hissed Ezio to himself. They've dragged one of my fellow Carmelites behind the church. I'm sure they're going to kill him. Carmelites? You are not Dominicans. Ezio left the man and made his way carefully round the outer walls of Santa Maria, hugging them. He moved as stealthily as a mongoose confronting a cobra. When he reached the walls of the church's garden, he skimmed to the roof. What he saw below him took even his experienced breath away. Several Borgia guards were beating the shit out of a tall young monk. He looked about thirty-five years old. Tell us, cried the leader of the guards. Tell us, or I will make you hurt so badly you'll wish you'd never been born. 
Where is the apple? Please, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. The lead guard leaned in close. Confess, your name is Savonarola. Yes, I told you, but you beat the name out of me. Then tell us and your suffering will cease. Where the fuck is the apple? The interrogator kicked the monk savagely in the crotch. The monk howled in pain. Not that that'll make much difference to a man in your missionary position, jeered the guard. Ezio watched, deeply concerned. If this monk was indeed Savonarola, the Borgia thugs might kill him before he himself got the truth out of the man. Why do you keep lying to me? sneered the guard. My master will not be pleased to hear you made me torture you to death. Do you want to get me into trouble? I don't have any apple, sobbed the monk. I'm just a simple friar. Please let me go. In a pig's eye. I know nothing, the monk cried piteously. If you want me to stop, shouted the guard, kicking him again in the same place, then tell me the truth, brother Girolamo Savonarola. The monk bit his lip, but stubbornly replied, I've told you everything I know. The guard kicked him again, and had his henchmen grab his ankles, and drag the man mercilessly along the cobbled ground, his head bouncing painfully on the hard stone. The monk screamed, and struggled in vain. Had enough, you abominato? The lead guard held his face close again. Are you so ready to meet your maker that you would lie again and again just to see him? I am a plain monk, wept the Carmelite, whose robes were dangerously similar in cut and colour to that of the Dominicans. I have no fruit of any kind, please. The guard kicked him again, in the same place, again. The monk's body twisted in an agony beyond tears. Ezio had had enough. He sprang down a phantom of vengeance, slicing for once in pure rage with poison dagger and double blade. Within a minute of sheer slaughter, the Borgia thugs, all of them, lay either dead or groaning in the same agony they'd inflicted on the flagstones of the courtyard. The monk, weeping, clung to Ezio's knees. Grazie, grazie, Salvatore! Ezio stroked his head. Calma, calma. It will be all right now, my brother. But Ezio also looked at the monk's fingers. All ten were intact. You have ten fingers, he murmured, disappointed despite himself. Yes, cried the monk, I have ten fingers, and I don't have any other apples than those that come to the monastery from the market every Thursday. He stood up, shook himself down, tenderly readjusted himself, and swore. In the name of God! Has the whole world stopped making sense? Who are you? Why did they take you? asked Ezio. Because they found out that indeed my family name is Savonarola. But why should I betray my cousin to those thugs? Do you know what he's done? I know nothing. He's a monk like me. He chose the harsher order of the Dominicans, it is true, but... He has lost a finger? Yes, but how could anyone... A kind of light was dawning in the monk's eyes. Who is Girolamo Savonarola? persisted Ezio. My cousin, and a devoted man of God. And who, may I ask, are you? Though I thank you humbly for my rescue, and owe you whatever favour you may ask. I am nameless, said Ezio. But do me the favour of telling me your name. Fra Marcello Savonarola, the monk replied meekly. Ezio took that in. His mind raced. Where is your cousin Girolamo? Fra Marcello thought, struggling with his conscience. It is true that my cousin has a singular view of how to serve God. He is spreading a doctrine of his own. You may find him now in Venice. And what does he do there? Marcello straightened his shoulders. I think he has set off on the wrong path. He preaches fire and brimstone. He claims to see the future. Marcello looked at Ezio through red-rimmed eyes, eyes full of agony. If you really want my opinion, he spews madness. Chapter 25 Ezio felt that he had spent too long on what seemed to be a fruitless quest. 
Chasing Savonarola seemed like chasing a will-o'-the-wisp or a chimera or your own tail. But the search had to continue remorselessly, for the nine-fingered man of God held the apple, the key to more than he could imagine possible, and he was a dangerous religious maniac, a loose cannon potentially less controllable than the master, Rodrigo Borgia, himself. It was Teodora who met him as he disembarked from the Ravenna galley at the Venice docks. Venice, in 1492, was still under the relatively honest rule of Doge Agostino Barbarigo. The city was abuzz with talk of how a Genoese seaman called Cristofa Corombo, whose mad plans to sail westwards across the ocean sea had been turned down by Venice, had got funding from Spain and was about to set out. Had Venice itself been mad not to fund the expedition? If Corombo succeeded, a safe sea passage to the Indies might be established, sidestepping the old land route now blocked by the Ottoman Turks. But Ezio's mind was far too full of other matters to pay much attention to these matters of politics and trade. We have your news, Theodora said, but are you certain? It's the only lead I've got, and it seems a good one. I'm certain that the apple is here again in the hands of the monk Savonarola. I hear he preaches to the masses of the hell and fire to come. I have heard of this man. Do you know where he can be found, Theodora? No. But I've seen a herald drawing crowds in the industrial district, preaching the kind of fire and brimstone stuff and nonsense you speak of. Perhaps he is a disciple of your monk. Come with me. You will certainly be my guest while you are here, and once you're settled we will go straight to where this man delivers his sermons. Both Ezio and Theodora, and indeed all intelligent and rational people, knew why a kind of blood and thunder hysteria was beginning to grip the people. The half-millennium year of 1500 was not far off, and many believed that that year would mark the second coming, when the Lord would come with clouds in his own glory and the glory of his Father, with ten thousand of his saints, even myriads of angels, and shall sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, and shall set the sheep, the saved, on his right hand, and the goats, the damned, upon the left. San Mateo's description of the Last Judgment reverberated through the imaginations of many. This herald and his boss are really cashing in on the febbre de fine secolo, said Theodora. For all I know, they believe in it themselves. I think they must do, said Ezio. The danger is that with the apple in their hands, they may actually bring about a world disaster that has nothing to do with God and everything to do with the devil. He paused. But for the moment they have not unleashed the power they have, and thank God for that, for I doubt if they would know how to control it. For the moment at least they seem content to foretell the apocalypse, and that, he laughed bitterly, has always been an easy sell. But it gets worse, said Theodora. Indeed you might almost believe that the apocalypse were really at hand. Have you heard the bad news? I have heard none since I left Forli. Lorenzo de' Medici has died at his villa in Careggi. Ezio looked grim. That is indeed a tragedy. Lorenzo was a true friend to my family, and without his protecting hand I fear I may never recover the Palazzo Auditore. But that is as nothing compared with what his death may mean to the peace he maintained between the city-states. It was always fragile at the best of times. There is more, said Theodora. And it is, if anything, worse news even than Lorenzo's death. She paused. You must brace yourself for this, Ezio. The Spaniard, Rodrigo Borgia, has been elected Pope. He rules the Vatican and Rome as the supreme pontiff, Alexander the Sixth. What? By what devilry? The conclave of Rome has only just ended this month. The rumour is that Rodrigo simply bought most of the votes. Even Ascanio Sforza, who was the most likely candidate standing against him, voted for him. Four mule loads of silver was his bribe, they say. What profits him to be Pope? What is it he seeks? Is such great influence not enough? Theodora looked at him. Now we are in the power of a wolf, Ezio. The most rapacious, perhaps, the world has ever seen. What you say is true, Theodora. 
but the power he seeks is even greater than that which the papacy will give him. If he controls the Vatican, he is that much closer to gaining access to the vault, and he is still on the trail of the apple, the piece of Eden he needs to give him the power of God himself. Let us pray that you get it back into the hands of the assassins. Rodrigo as Pope and Master of the Templars is dangerous enough, once he has the apple as well. She broke off. As you say, he will be indestructible. It's odd, said Azio. What is? Our friend Savonarola doesn't know it, but he has two huntsmen chasing him. Theodora conducted Ezio to the large open square in the industrial quarter of Venice, where the herald was wont to conduct his sermons, and left him there. Ezio, his hood up and his face lowered but watchful, blended in with the crowd that was already gathering. It wasn't long before the square was packed, the mob thronging around the small wooden stage onto which a man now stepped, an ascetic-looking man with cold blue eyes and hollow cheeks, iron-grey hair and gnarled hands, dressed in a plain grey woollen robe. He started to speak, pausing only when the mad cheers of the crowd obliged him to. Ezio saw how skillfully one man could work hundreds into a state of blind hysteria. Gather, children, and hear my cry, for the end of days draws nigh. Are you ready for what is to come? Are you ready to see the light my brother Savonarola has blessed us with? He raised his hands, and Ezio, who knew exactly what light the herald was referring to, listened soberly. Dark days are upon us, continued the herald, but my brother has shown me the path forward unto salvation, unto the heavenly light that awaits us. But only if we are ready, only if we embrace him. Let Savonarola be our guide, for he alone knows what is to come. He shall not lead us astray. Now the herald leant forward earnestly on the lectern before him. Are you ready for the final reckoning, brothers and sisters? Whom shall you follow when the time comes? He paused again for effect. There are many in the churches who claim to offer salvation, the summoners, the pardoners, the scatterbrained slaves of superstition. But nay, my children, they are all enthralled to the Borgia Pope, all enthralled to Pope Alexander, the sixth and most mortgaged of that name. The crowd screamed. Ezio inwardly winced. He remembered the apparent prophecies he had seen the apple project in Leonardo's workshop. Somewhere in the distant future, a time when hell would truly be unleashed upon the earth, unless he could stop it. Our new Pope Alexander is not a spiritual man. He's not a man of the soul. Men like him buy your prayers and sell your benefices for profit. All the priests of our churches are ecclesiastical merchants. Only one among us is a true man of the Spirit. Only one among us has seen the future and spoken with the Lord. My brother Savonarola, he shall lead us. Ezio thought, had that mad monk opened the apple as he had himself? Had he unleashed the same visions? What was it Leonardo had said about the apple? Unsafe for weaker brains. Savonarola shall lead us to the light, the herald was concluding. Savonarola shall tell us what is to come. Savonarola shall carry us to the front door of heaven itself. We shall not want in the new world that Savonarola has borne witness to. Brother Savonarola walks the very path to God we have been seeking. He raised his hands again as the mob yelled and cheered. Ezio knew that the only way to find the monk was through this acolyte, but he had to find a way to reach the man without arousing the suspicions of the devoted crowd. He made his way forward cautiously, acting the role of the meek man seeking conversion to the herald's flock. It wasn't easy. He was jostled aggressively by people who could see he was a stranger, a newcomer, a person to be regarded with reserve. But he smiled bowed, and even, as a last resort, threw money down, saying, I want to give alms to the cause of Savonarola and those who support him and believe in him. And money worked its usual charm. In fact, Ezio thought, money is the greatest converter of them all. At last the herald, 
who'd observed Ezio's progress with a mixture of amusement and contempt, bade his minders step aside and beckon to him, leading him to a quiet place, a little piazzetta off the main square, where they could have a private conversation. Ezio was pleased to see that the herald clearly thought he'd made an important and wealthy new addition to his flock. Where is Savonarola himself? he asked. He is everywhere, brother, replied the herald. He is at one with all of us, and all of us are at one with him. Listen, friend, said Ezio urgently. I seek the man, not the myth. Please tell me where he is. The herald looked at him askance and Ezio clearly saw the madness in his eyes. I have told you where he is. Look, Savonarola loves you just as you are. He will show you the light. He will show you the future. But I must talk to him myself. I must see the great leader, and I have great riches to bring to his mighty crusade. The herald looked cunning at that. I see, he said. Be patient. The hour is not yet come, but you shall join us in our pilgrimage, brother. And Ezio was patient. He was patient for a long time. Then one day he received a summons from the herald to meet him at the Venice dockyards at dusk. He arrived early and waited impatiently and nervously, until finally he saw a shadowy figure approaching through the evening mists. I was not sure you would come he greeted the herald. The herald looked pleased. The quest for truth is passionate in you, brother, and it has withstood the test of time. But now we are ready, and our great leader has assumed the mantle of command he was born to. Come. He motioned ahead of him and led Ezio to the quayside where a large galley waited. Near it, a crowd of the faithful waited. The herald addressed them. My children! It is time at last for us to depart. Our brother and spiritual leader Girolamo Savonarola awaits us in the city he has at last made his own. Yes, he has. The son of a bitch bastard has brought my town and my home to its knees, to the brink of insanity. The crowd and Ezio turned to look at the person who had spoken. A long-haired young man in a black cap, with full lips and a weak face, now contorted in anger. I have just escaped from there, he continued, thrown out of my dukedom by that prick King Charles of France, whose meddling has caused me to be replaced by that dog of God, Savonarola. The crowd's mood turned ugly, and they would surely have seized the young man and thrown him into the lagoon if the herald had not stayed them. Let the man speak his mind, ordered the herald, and turning to the stranger, asked, Why do you take Savonarola's name in vain, brother? Why? Why? Because of what he's done to Florence. He controls the city. The Signoria are either behind him or powerless against him. He whips up the mob, and even people who should know better, like Maestro Botticelli, follow him slavishly. They burn books, works of art, anything which that madman deems immoral. Savonarola is in Florence now, asked Ezio intently. You're sure? Would it were otherwise? Would he were on the moon or in hell's mouth? I barely got away with my life. And who might you be exactly, brother? asked the herald, impatient now and showing it. The young man drew himself up. I am Piero de' Medici, son of Lorenzo il Magnifico and rightful ruler of Florence. Ezio clasped his hand. Well met, Piero. Your father was my staunch friend. Piero looked at him. Thank you for that, whoever you may be. As for my father, he was lucky to die before all this madness broke like a giant wave over our city. He turned heedlessly to the angry crowd. Do not support that wretched monk. He is a dangerous fool with an ego the size of the Duomo. He should be put down like the mad dog he is. Now, as one, the crowd growled in righteous fury. The herald turned to Piero and yelled, Heretic! Cedar of evil thoughts! To the crowd he cried, this is the man who must be put down, be silenced, he must burn. Both Piero and Ezio by his side had their swords out by now, and faced the menacing mob. Who are you? asked Piero. Auditore, Ezio, he replied. Ah, 
Sono grato del tuo aiuto. My father spoke of you often. His eyes flickered over their adversaries. Are we going to get out of this? I hope so, but you weren't exactly tactful. How was I to know? You've just destroyed untold effort and preparation. But never mind, look to your sword. The fight was hard but short. The two men let the mob beat them back to an abandoned warehouse, and it was there that they took their stand. Luckily, though enraged, the crowd of pilgrims were far from being seasoned fighters, and once the boldest of them had retreated nursing deep cuts and slashes from Ezio's and Piero's longswords, the rest of them fell back and fled. Only the herald, grim and grey, stood his ground. Imposter, he said to Ezio, you shall freeze forever in the ice of the fourth ring of the ninth circle, and it is I who will send you there. From his robes he produced a keen-edged basilard and ran at Ezio, holding it above his head, ready to strike. Ezio, backing, almost fell and was at the herald's mercy, but Piero sliced at the man's legs and Ezio, having regained his feet, unleashed his double blade, punching the sharp points deep into the man's abdomen. The herald's whole frame shuddered with the impact. He gasped and fell, writhing and twitching, clawing the ground, until at last he was still. Hope that pays you back for the bad turn I've done you, said Piero, with a rueful smile. Come on, let's get to the doge's palace and tell Agostino to send a watch out to make sure that bunch of lunatics are split up and that they've all gone back to their kennels. Grazie, said Ezio, but I go the other way. I go to Florence. Piero looked at him incredulously. What? Into the mouth of hell itself? I have my own reasons for seeking out Savonarola. But perhaps it's not too late to undo the damage he's done to our native city as well. Then I wish you luck, said Piero. Whatever end you seek. Chapter 26 Fra Girolamo Savonarola took over the effective government of Florence in 1494, aged 42. He was a tormented man, a twisted genius, and the worst kind of fanatical believer. But the most frightening thing about him was that people allowed him not only to lead them, but to incite them to commit the most ludicrous and destructive acts of folly, all based on a terror of hellfire and on a doctrine which taught that all pleasure, all worldly goods, and all the works of man were despicable, and that only by complete self-abnegation could a person find the true light of faith. No wonder, thought Ezio, pondering these things as he rode towards his hometown, that Leonardo stayed put in Milan. Apart from anything else, from his friend's point of view, Ezio had learned that homosexuality, hitherto winked at or punishable by an affordable fine, was once again a capital offence in Florence. And no wonder, too, that the great materialist and humanist school of thinkers and poets who had gathered around the nurturing and enlightened spirit of Lorenzo had broken up and sought less barren soil than the intellectual desert which Florence was fast becoming. As he approached the city, Ezio became aware of large groups of black-robed monks and soberly attired laymen heading in the same direction. All looked solemn but righteous. All walked with their heads bent. Where are you bound? he asked one of these passers-by. To Florence, to sit at the feet of the great leader, said a pasty-faced merchant, before continuing on his way. The road was broad, and approaching him from the city, Ezio saw another mass of people, evidently leaving town. They also walked with their heads bent, and their expressions were serious and depressed. As they passed him, Ezio heard snatches of their conversations, and realized that these people were going into voluntary exile. They pushed carts piled high, or carried sacks or bundles of possessions. They were refugees, banished from their home either by edict of the monk, or by choice, since they could bear to live under his rule no longer. If Piero had had only a tenth of his father's talent, we'd have somewhere to call home, said one. We never should have let that madman gain a foothold in our city, muttered another. Look at all the misery he's wrought. What I don't understand is why so many of us are willing to accept his oppression, said a woman. Well, anywhere's better than Florence now, another woman said. We were just thrown out when we refused to hand over everything we owned to his precious church of San Marco. 
It's sorcery. That's the only way I can explain it. Even Maestro Botticelli is under Savonarola's spell. Mind you, the man's getting old. He must be damn near fifty. Maybe he's hedging his bets with heaven. Book burnings, arrests, all those endless bloody sermons. And to think what Florence was just two short years ago. A beacon against ignorance. And now here we are again, back mired in the Dark Ages. And then a woman said something which made Ezio prick up his ears. Sometimes I wish the assassin would return to Florence, that we might be free of this tyranny. In your dreams, replied her friend, the assassin's a myth, a bogeyman parents tell their children about. You're wrong. My father saw him in San Gimignano, the first woman sighed. But it was years ago. Yeah, yeah, se lo tu dici. Ezio rode on past them, his heart heavy. But his spirits rose when he saw a familiar figure coming along the road to meet him. Salute, Ezio, said Machiavelli, his serious, humorous face, older now, but more interesting for the etching of the years. Salute, Niccolo. You've picked a fine time for a homecoming. You know me. Where there's sickness, I like to try to cure it. We could certainly use your help now, Machiavelli sighed. There's no doubt Savonarola couldn't have got where he is now without the use of that powerful artifact, the apple. He held up his hand. I know all about what has happened to you since last we met. Caterina sent a courier from Forli two years ago, and more recently one arrived with a letter from Piero in Venice. I'm here for the apple. It has been out of our hands far too long. I suppose in a sense we should be grateful to the ghastly Girolamo, said Machiavelli. At least he kept it out of the new Pope's hands. Has he tried anything? He keeps trying. There's a rumour that Alexander's planning to excommunicate our dear Dominican. Not that that'll change much around here, Ezio said. We should get to work on retrieving it without delay. The apple? Of course. Though it'll be more complicated than you might think. Ha! When isn't it? Ezio looked at him. Why don't you fill me in on things? Come, let's go back to the city. I'll tell you everything I know. There's little to relate. In a nutshell, King Charles VIII of France finally managed to bring Florence to its knees. Piero fled. Charles, land-hungry as ever, why the hell they call him the affable is beyond me, marched on to Naples, and Savonarola, the ugly duckling, suddenly saw his chance and filled the power vacuum. He's like any dictator anywhere, tin pot or grand, totally humorless, totally convinced, and filled with an unshakable sense of his own importance. The most effective and the nastiest kind of prince you could wish for. He paused. One day I'll write a book about it. And the apple was the means to his end. Machiavelli spread his hands. Only in part. A lot of it, I hate to say, is down to his own charisma. It isn't the city itself he's enthralled, but its leaders, men possessed of influence and power. Of course, some of the Signoria opposed him at first, but now... Machiavelli looked worried. Now they're all in his pocket. The man everyone once reviled suddenly became the one they worshipped. If people didn't agree, they were obliged to leave. It's still happening, as you've seen today. And now the Florentine Council oppress the citizens and ensure that the mad monk's will is done. But what of decent, ordinary people? Do they really act as if they had no say at all in the matter? Machiavelli smiled sadly. You know the answer to that as well as I do, Ezio. Rare is the man willing to oppose the status quo. And so, it falls to us to help them see their way through this. By now the two assassins had reached the city gates. The armed guards of the city, like all police, serving the interest of the state without reference to its morality, scrutinised their papers and waved them through, though not before Ezio had noticed another pack of them busy piling up the corpses of some other uniforms who carried the Borgia crest. He pointed this out to Niccolo. Oh yes, said Machiavelli. As I said, friend Rodrigo, I'll never get used to calling the bastard Alexander, keeps trying. 
He sends his soldiers into Florence, and Florence sends them back, usually in pieces. So he does know the apples here. Of course he does. And I must admit, it's an unfortunate complication. And where is Savonarola? He rules the city from the Convento di San Marco, almost never leaves it. Thank God Fra Angelico didn't live to see the day Brother Girolamo moved in. They dismounted, stabled their horses, and Machiavelli arranged lodgings for Ezio. Paola's old house of pleasure was shut down, along with all the others, as Machiavelli explained. Sex and gambling, dancing and pageantry were all high on the list of Savonarola's no-nos. Righteous killing and oppression, on the other hand, were fine. After Ezio was settled, Machiavelli walked with him towards the great religious complex of St. Mark. Ezio's eyes ranged the buildings appraisingly. A direct assault against Savonarola would be dangerous, he decided, especially with the apple in his possession. True, agreed Machiavelli. But what other option is there? Aside from the city leaders, who doubtless have vested interests, are you convinced that the people's minds are fundamentally their own? An optimist might be inclined to take a bet on it, said Machiavelli. My point is, they follow the monk not by choice, but by dint of force and fear. No one apart from a Dominican or a politician would argue with that. Then I propose we use this to our advantage. If we can silence his lieutenants and stir up discontent, Savonarola will be distracted and we'll have a chance to strike. Machiavelli smiled. That's clever. There ought to be an adjective to describe people like you. I'll speak with La Volpe and Paola. Yes, they're still here, though they've had to go underground. They can help us organize an uprising as you free the districts. Then it's settled. Ezio was troubled, though, and Machiavelli could see it. He led him to the quiet cloister of a little church nearby and sat him down. What is it, friend? he asked. Two things, but they are personal. Tell me. My old family palazzo. What's become of it? I hardly dare go to look. A shadow passed across Machiavelli's face. My dear Ezio, be strong. Your palazzo stands, but Lorenzo's ability to protect it lasted only as long as his own power, his own life. Piero tried to follow his father's example, but after he was kicked out by the French, the Palazzo Auditore was requisitioned and used as a billet for Charles's Swiss mercenaries. After they had moved south, Savonarola's men stripped it of everything that was left in it and closed the place down. Have courage. One day you will restore it. And Annetta? As she escaped, thank God, and joined your mother at Monterigioni. That at least is something. After a silence, Machiavelli asked, And what is the second thing? Ezio whispered, Christina. You ask me to tell you hard things, amico mio. Machiavelli frowned. But you must know the truth. He paused. My friend, she is dead. Manfredo would not leave as many of their friends left after the twin plagues of the French and Savonarola. He was convinced that Piero would organize a counter-offensive and get the city back. But there was an horrific night, soon after the monk came to power, when all those who would not voluntarily commit their belongings to the bonfires of the vanities which the monk organized to burn and destroy all luxurious and worldly things, had their houses ransacked and put to the torch. Ezio listened, making himself stay calm, though his heart was bursting. Savonarola's fanatics, Machiavelli went on, forced their way into the Palazzo d'Arcenta. Manfredo tried to defend himself, but there were too many pitted against him and his own men, and Cristina would not leave him. Machiavelli paused for a long moment, fighting back tears himself. In their frenzy, those religious maniacs cut her down too. Ezio stared at the whitewashed wall in front of him. Every last detail, every last crack, even the ants moving across it, 
all were thrown into dreadful focus. Chapter 27 How every hope of ours is raised in vain! How spoiled the plans we laid so fair and well! How ignorance throughout the earth doth reign! Death, who is mistress of us all, can tell. In song and dance and jousts some pass their days, some vow their talents unto gentle arts. Some hold the world in scorn and all its ways. Some hide the impulses that move their hearts. Vain thoughts and wishes, cares of every kind, greatly upon this erring earth prevail, in various presents after nature's law. Fortune doth fashion with inconstant mind. All things are transient here below and frail. Death only standeth fast for evermore. Ezio let the book of Lorenzo's sonnets fall from his hand. The death of Christina made him all the more determined to remove its cause. His city had suffered long enough under the rule of Savonarola. Too many of his fellow citizens, from every conceivable walk of life, had fallen under his spell, and those who disagreed were either discriminated against, driven underground, or forced into exile. It was time to act. We have lost to exile many people who might have helped us, Machiavelli explained to him, but even Savonarola's chief enemies outside the city-state, I mean the Duke of Milan and our old friend Rodrigo, Pope Alexander VI, haven't been able to dislodge him. And what of these bonfires? The most insane thing of all. Savonarola and his close associates organized groups of their followers to go from door to door, demanding the surrender of any and all objects they deemed to be morally questionable, even cosmetics and mirrors, let alone paintings, books considered to be immoral, all sorts of games, including chess, for God's sake, musical instruments, you name it. If the monk and his followers think they distract from their take on religion, they've been brought to the Piazza della Signoria, placed on huge bonfires, and burned. Machiavelli shook his head. Florence has lost much of value and much of beauty in this way. But surely the city must be getting weary of this kind of behaviour. Machiavelli brightened. That is true, and that feeling is our best ally. I think Savonarola genuinely believes that the day of judgment is at hand. The only trouble is it shows no sign of coming, and even some who started out believing in him fervently are beginning to falter in their faith. Unfortunately, there are many of influence and power here who still support him without question. If they could be removed. So began for Ezio a frenetic period of hunting down and dispatching a series of such supporters, and they did indeed come from all walks of life. There were an artist of note, an old soldier, a merchant, several priests, a doctor, a farmer, and one or two aristocrats, all of whom clung fanatically to the ideas imbued in them by the monk. Some saw the folly of their ways before they died. Others remained unshaken in their conviction. Ezio, as he carried out this unpleasant task, was more often than not threatened with death himself. But soon the rumours began to filter through the city. Talk heard in the late hours mutterings in illicit tavernas and back alleys. The assassin is back. The assassin has come to save Florence. It saddened Ezio to the core to see the city of his birth, his family, his heritage, so abused by the hatred and insanity of religious fervour. It was with a hardened heart that he plied his trade of death, a cold, icy wind cleansing the bastardised city of those who had pulled Firenze from her glory. As ever, he killed with compassion, knowing that no other way was possible for those who had fallen so far from God. Through these hours of darkness, he never once swerved from his duty to the creed of the assassin. Gradually, the general mood of the city wavered, and Savonarola saw his support ebbing as Machiavelli, La Volpe and Paola worked in tandem with Ezio to organise an uprising, an uprising guided by a slow but forceful process of enlightenment of the people. The last of the targets for Ezio was a beguiled preacher, who at the time Ezio tracked him down was preaching to a crowd in front of the church of Santo Spirito. 
people of Florence, come, gather round, listen well to what I say. The end approaches. Now is the time to repent, to beg God's forgiveness. Listen to me if you cannot see what is happening for yourselves. The signs are all around us. Unrest, famine, disease, corruption. These are the harbingers of darkness. We must stand firm in our devotion lest they consume us all. He scanned them with his fiery eyes. I see you doubt that you think me mad. Ah, but did the Romans not say the same of Jesus? Know that I too once shared your uncertainty, your fear. But that was before Savonarola came to me. He showed me the truth. At last my eyes were opened. And so I stand before you today in the hope that I might open yours as well. The preacher paused for breath. Understand that we stand upon a precipice. On one side, the shining, glorious kingdom of God. On the other, a bottomless pit of despair. Already you teeter precariously on the edge. Men like the Medici and the other families you once called masters sought earthly goods and gain. They abandoned their beliefs in favor of material pleasures, and they would have seen you all do the same. He paused again, this time for effect, and continued. Our wise prophet once said, The only good thing that we owe Plato and Aristotle is that they brought forward many arguments which we can use against the heretics. Yet they and other philosophers are now in hell. If you value your immortal souls, you'll turn back from this unholy course and embrace the teachings of our prophet Savonarola. Then you will sanctify your bodies and spirits. You will discover the glory of God. You will at last become what our Creator intended, loyal and obedient servants. But the crowd, already thinning out, was losing interest, and the last few people were now moving away. Ezio stepped forward and addressed the beguiled preacher. Your mind, he said. I sense it is your own. The preacher laughed. Not all of us required persuasion or coercion to be convinced. I already believed. All I have said is true. Nothing is true, replied Ezio. And what I do now is no easy thing. He unsprung his wrist blade and ran the preacher through. Requiescat in pace, he said. Turning away from the kill, he pulled his cowl close over his head. It was a long, hard road, but towards the end Savonarola himself became the assassin's unwitting ally, because Florence's financial power waned. The monk detested both commerce and making money, the two things which had made the city great, and still the Day of Judgment did not come. Instead, a liberal Franciscan friar challenged the monk to an ordeal by fire. The monk refused to accept, and his authority took another knock. By the beginning of May 1497, many of the city's young men marched in protest, and the protest became a riot. After that, taverns started to reopen. People went back to singing and dancing and gambling and whoring, enjoying themselves, in fact. And businesses and banks reopened as, slowly at first, exiles returned to the city quarters now liberated from the monks' regime. It didn't happen overnight, but finally, a year almost to the day after the riot, for the man clung doggedly to power, the moment of Savonarola's fall seemed imminent. You've done well, Ezio. Paola told him, as they waited with La Volpe and Machiavelli before the gates of the San Marco complex, together with a large, expectant and unruly crowd gathered from the free districts. Thank you. But what happens now? Watch, said Machiavelli. With a loud crash, a door opened above their heads, and a lean figure swathed in black appeared on a balcony. The monk glowered at the assembled populace. Silence! he commanded. I demand silence! Awed despite themselves, the crowd quietened. Why are you here? demanded Savonarola. Why do you disturb me? You should be cleansing your homes. But the crowd roared its disapproval. Of what? one man yelled. 
You've already taken everything. I have held my hand, Savonarola shouted back. But now you will do as I command. You will submit. And from his robes he produced the apple and raised it high. Ezio saw that the hand which held it lacked a finger. Instantly the apple started to glow, and the crowd fell back, gasping. But Machiavelli, remaining calm, steadied himself and unhesitatingly threw a knife which pierced the monk's forearm. With a cry of pain and rage, Savonarola let go of the apple, which fell from the balcony into the throng below. No! he screamed. But all of a sudden he seemed diminished, his demeanour both embarrassing and pathetic. That was enough for the mob. It rallied and stormed the gates of San Marco. Quick, Ezio, said La Volpe. Find the apple. It can't be far away. Ezio could see it rolling unheeded between the feet of the crowd. He dived in among them, getting badly knocked about, but at last it was within his grasp. Quickly he transferred it to the safety of his belt pouch. The gates of San Marco were open now. Probably some of the brethren within considered that discretion was the better part of valour and wanted to save their church and monastery as well as their own skins by bowing to the inevitable. There were not a few among them, too, who had had enough of the monk's tiresome despotism. The crowd surged through the gates to re-emerge some minutes later, bearing Savonarola kicking and screaming on their shoulders. Take him to the Palazzo della Signoria, commanded Machiavelli. Let him be tried there. Idiots! Blasphemers! yelled Savonarola. God bears witness to this sacrilege. How dare you handle his prophet in this way? He was partly drowned out by the angry shouts of the crowd, but he was as livid as he was frightened, and he kept it up, for the monk knew, not that he thought in quite these terms, that this was his last roll of the dice. Heretics! You'll all burn in hell for this! Do you hear me? Burn! Ezio and his fellow assassins followed as the mob bore the monk away, still crying out his mixture of pleas and threats. The sword of God will fall upon the earth swiftly and suddenly. Release me, for only I can save you from his wrath. My children, heed me before it is too late. There is but one true salvation, and you forsake the path to it for mere material gain. If you do not bow again to me, all Florence shall know the anger of the Lord, and this city will fall like Sodom and Gomorrah, for he will know the depth of your betrayal. Aiuta mi Dio! I am brought down by ten thousand Judases! Ezio was close enough to hear one of the citizens carrying the monk say, Oh, enough of your lies. You've been pouring out nothing but misery and hatred since you first walked among us. God may be in your head, monk, said another, but he is far from your heart. They were approaching the Piazza della Signoria now, and others in the crowd took up the triumphant cry. We have suffered enough. We shall be free people once more. Soon the light of life will return to our city. We must punish the traitor. He is the true heretic. He twisted the word of God to suit himself, a woman shouted. The yoke of religious tyranny is broken at last, another exclaimed. Savonarola will at last be punished. The truth illuminates us and fear has fled, yelled a third. Your words hold sway here no more, monk. You claim to be his prophet, but your words were dark and cruel. You called us puppets of the devil. I think perhaps the true puppet was you. Ezio and his friends had no need to intercede further. The machinery they had set in motion would do the rest of their work for them. The leaders of the city, as eager to save their own skins as to claw back power for themselves, streamed out of the Signoria to show their support. A stage was erected, and on it a huge stack of kindling and wood was raised around three stakes, while Savonarola and his two most ardent lieutenants were dragged into the Signoria for a brief and savage trial. As he had shown no mercy, no mercy would be shown to him. Soon they reappeared in shackles, were led to the stakes, and bound to them. O oh Lord, my God, pity me, Savonarola was heard to plead. Deliver me from evil's embrace. Surrounded as I am by sin, I cry out to you for salvation. You wanted to burn me, a man jeered. Now the tables are turned. 
The executioners put torches into the wood around the stakes. Ezio watched, his mind on his kinsmen who had met their end so many years ago at this selfsame place. In Felix Ego, prayed Savonarola, in a loud voice filled with pain as the fire began to take. Omnium auxilio destitutus. I have broken the laws of heaven and earth. Which way can I turn? Whom can I run to? Who will take pity on me? I dare not look up to heaven as I have sinned grievously against it. I can find no refuge on earth as I have been a scandal to it also. Ezio approached, getting as close as he could. Despite the grief he has occasioned me, no man, even this one, deserves to die in such pain, he thought. He extracted his loaded pistola from his satchel and attached it to his right arm mechanism. At that moment, Savonarola noticed him and stared half in fear and half in hope. It's you, he said, raising his voice above the roar of the fire. But in essence, the two communicated by an interconnection of their minds. I knew this day would come. Brother, please show me the pity I did not show you. I left you to the mercy of wolves and dogs. Ezio raised his arm. Farewell, padre, he said, and fired. In the pandemonium around the blaze, his movement and the noise the gun made went unnoticed. Savonarola's head sank onto his chest. Go now in peace, that you may be judged by your God, said Ezio quietly. Requiescat in pace. He glanced at the two lieutenant monks, Domenico and Silvestro, but they were already dead, their burst guts spewed out on the hissing fire. The stench of burnt meat was heavy in everyone's nostrils. The crowd was beginning to calm down. Soon there was little noise other than the crackling of the flames as they finished their work. Ezio stepped away from the pyres. Standing at a short distance, he saw Machiavelli, Paola and La Volpe watching him. Machiavelli caught his eye and made a small gesture of encouragement. Ezio knew what he had to do. He mounted the stage at the far end from the bonfires, and all eyes turned to him. Citizens of Florence, he said in a clarion voice, Twenty-two years ago I stood where I stand now and watched my loved ones die, betrayed by those I had counted friends. Vengeance clouded my mind. It would have consumed me had it not been for the wisdom of a few strangers who taught me to look beyond my instincts. They never preached answers, but guided me to learn from myself. Ezio saw that his fellow assassins had now been joined by Uncle Mario, who smiled and raised a hand in salute. My friends, he continued, we don't need anyone to tell us what to do. Not Savonarola, not the Pazzi, not even the Medici. We are free to follow our own path. He paused. There are those who would take that freedom from us, and too many of you, too many of us, alas, gladly give it. But we have it within our power to choose, to choose whatever we deem true, and it is the exercise of that power which makes us human. There is no book or teacher to give us the answers, to show us a path. So, choose your own way. Do not follow me or anyone else. With an inward smile, he noticed how disquieted some of the members of the Signoria were looking. Perhaps mankind would never change, but it didn't hurt to give it a nudge. He jumped down, pulled his hood over his head, and walked out of the square down the street running along the north wall of the Signoria, which he had memorably walked down twice before, and vanished from sight. And there then began for Ezio the last long, hard quest of his life before the final confrontation he knew was inevitable. With Machiavelli at his side, he organized his fellows of the Order of the Assassins from Florence and Venice to roam throughout the Italian peninsula, travelling far and wide, armed with copies of Girolamo's map, 
painstakingly gathering the remaining missing pages of the Great Codex, scouring the provinces of Piedmont, of Trent, of Liguria, Umbria, Veneto, Friuli, Lombardy, of Emilia-Romagna, the Marche, Tuscany, Lazio, Abruzzo, of Molise, Apulia, Campania, and Basilicata, and of dangerous Calabria. They spent perhaps too much time in Capri, and crossed the Tyrrhenian Sea to the land of kidnappers, Sardinia, and wicked, gangsterized Sicily. They visited kings and courted dukes. They battled those Templars they encountered on the same mission. But in the end, they triumphed. They reassembled at Monteregioni. It had taken five long years, and Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, old now but still strong, remained Pope in Rome. The power of the Templars, though diminished, still posed a grave threat. Much remained to be done. Chapter 28 One morning early in August 1503, Ezio, a man now of forty-four, his temples streaked with grey but his beard still dark chestnut, was bidden by his uncle to join him and the rest of the company of assassins there assembled in his study at his castle of Monterigioni. Paola, Machiavelli, and La Volpe had been joined by Teodora, Antonio, and Bartolomeo. It is time, Ezio, said Mario solemnly. We hold the apple, and now all the missing codex pages are collected here together. Let us now finish what you and my brother, your father, started so long ago. Perhaps we can at long last make sense of the prophecy buried within the Codex, and finally break the inexorable power of the Templars for ever. Then, uncle, we should begin by locating the vault. The Codex pages you have reassembled should lead us to it. Mario swung back the bookcase to reveal the wall on which the Codex, now in its entirety, hung. Near it, on a pedestal, stood the apple. This is how the pages relate to one another, said Mario, as they all took in the complex design. It appears to show a map of the world, but a world bigger than we know, with continents to the west and south which we are unaware of. Yet I am convinced they exist. There are other elements, said Machiavelli. Here on the left you can see the traced outline of what can only be a crozier, indeed what may be a papal staff. On the right is clearly a depiction of the apple. In the middle of the pages we can now see a dozen dots marked in a pattern whose significance is as yet mysterious. As he spoke, the apple began to glow of its own accord, and finally flashed blindingly, illuminating the codex pages and seeming to embrace them. Then it resumed its dull, neutral state. Why did it do that? At that precise moment, asked Ezio, wishing Leonardo had been there to explain, or at least deduce. He was trying to remember what his friend had said about the singular properties of this curious machine, though Ezio didn't know what it was. It seemed to be as much living thing as mechanism. But some instinct told him to trust in it. Another mystery to unravel, said La Volpe. How can this be possible? asked Paola. Undiscovered continents. Perhaps continents waiting to be rediscovered, suggested Ezio, but his tone was one of awe. How can this be? said Theodora. Machiavelli replied, Perhaps the vault holds the answer. Can we see what it is located now? asked the ever practical Antonio. Let's look, said Ezio, examining the codex. If we trace lines between these dots, he did so. They converge, see? On a single location. He stepped back. No, it cannot be. The vault. It looks as if the vault is in Rome. He looked round the assembled company, and they read his next thought. It explains why Rodrigo was so anxious to become Pope, said Mario. Eleven years he's ruled the Holy See, but he still lacks the means to crack its darkest secret, though he clearly must know he's at the spot itself. 
Of course, said Machiavelli. In a sense, you have to admire him. He's not only managed to locate the vault, but by becoming Pope, he has control of the staff. The staff, said Theodora. Mario spoke. The Codex always mentioned two pieces of Eden, that is, two keys. It can mean nothing else. One, he turned his eyes to it, is the apple. And the other is the papal staff, cried Ezio in realization. The papal staff is the second piece of Eden. Precisely, said Machiavelli. My God, you're right, Uncle Mario barked. He suddenly became grave. For years, for decades, we have sought these answers. And now we have them, added Paola. But so too might the Spaniard, put in Antonio. We don't know that there aren't copies of the Codex. We don't know that even if his own collection is incomplete, he nevertheless has enough information to... He broke off. And if he does, if he finds a way into the vault, he dropped his voice. Its contents will make the apple seem a trifling thing. Two keys, Mario reminded them. The vault needs two keys to open it. But we can't take any risks, said Ezio urgently. I must ride now to Rome and find the vault. No one disagreed. Ezio looked at each of their faces in turn. And what of the rest of you? Bartolomeo, who had hitherto remained silent, now spoke with less than his usual bluffness. I'll do what I do best. Cause some trouble in the Eternal City, some uproar. Cause a diversion so you can get on undisturbed. We'll all help make the way as clear as possible for you, friend, said Machiavelli. Just let me know when you're ready, Nipote, and we'll all be behind you, said Mario. Tutti per uno e uno per tutti. Grazie, amici, said Ezio. I know you'll be there when I need you, but let me carry the burden of this last quest. A lone fish can slip through a net that catches a shoal, and the Templars will be on their guard. They made their preparations fast, and soon after halfway through the month, Ezio, the precious apple in his custody, arrived by boat on the Tiber at the wharfs near the Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome. He had taken every precaution but by some devilry or the astuteness of Rodrigo's ubiquitous spies, his arrival did not pass unnoticed, and he was challenged by a squad of Borgia guards at the gates to the wharfs. He would have to fight his way to the Passetto di Borgo, the half-mile-long elevated passage that linked the Castel with the Vatican. Knowing that time was against them, now that Rodrigo must know of his arrival, Ezio decided that a quick, precise attack was his only option. He sprang like a lynx onto the mantle of an ox-drawn cart that was taking barrels from the docks, and skipping onto the higher-most barrel, he leapt up to an overhanging gantry. The guards watched open-mouthed as the assassin launched himself from the gantry, cloak billowing out behind him. Dagger drawn, he slew the Borgia sergeant atop his horse, and relieved him of his mount. The whole manoeuvre had unfolded in less time than it had taken for the remaining guards to draw their swords. Ezio, without looking back, rode off down the Passetto far faster than the Borgia uniforms could pursue him. As he arrived at his destination, Ezio found that the gate through which he had to enter was too low and narrow for a horseman, so he dismounted and continued through it on foot, dispatching the two men who guarded it with a single deft movement of his blades. Despite his gathering years, Ezio had intensified his training and was now at the peak of his powers the pinnacle of his order, the supreme assassin. Beyond the gate he found himself in a narrow courtyard, at the other side of which was yet another gate. It seemed to be unguarded, but as he approached the lever at its side, which he assumed would open it, a cry went up from the ramparts above, Stop the intruder! Glancing behind him, he saw the gate through which he had entered, slamming shut. He was caught in that cramped enclave. He threw himself on the lever controlling the second gate, as the archers ranging themselves above him prepared to fire, and just managed to dash through it as the arrows clattered to the ground behind him. Now he was inside the Vatican. 
moving cat-like through its labyrinthine corridors and melting into the shadows at the merest hint of now alerted guards passing, for he could not afford confrontation which might give his position away, he found himself at last in the vast cave of the Sistine Chapel. Baccio Pontelli's masterpiece, built for the assassin's old enemy Pope Sixtus IV, and completed twenty years earlier, loomed around and above him, the many candles lit at this time just penetrating the gloom. Ezio could make out wall paintings by Ghirlandaio, Botticelli, Perugino and Rosselli, but the great vault of the ceiling had as yet to be decorated. He had entered by a stained glass window which was undergoing repair, and he balanced on an interior embrasure overlooking the vast hall. Below him, Alexander VI, in full golden regalia, was conducting the Mass, reading from the Gospel of San Giovanni. In principio erat verbum, et verbum erat apud Deum, et Deus erat verbum. Hoc erat in principio apud Deum. Omnia per ipsum fact sunt, et sine ipso factum est nihil quid factum est. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Ezio watched until the service came to its conclusion, and the congregation began filing out leaving the Pope alone with his cardinals and attendant priests. Did the Spaniard know Ezio was there? Did he plan some kind of confrontation? Ezio did not know, but he could see that here was a golden opportunity to rid the world of this most menacing Templar. Bracing himself, he threw himself outwards and downwards off the embrasure to land close to the Pope in a perfect crouch, springing up immediately before the man or his attendants could have time to react or call out, and driving his spring blade hard and deep into Alexander's swollen body. The Pope sank soundlessly to the ground at Ezio's feet, and lay still. Ezio stood over him, breathing hard. I thought, I thought I was beyond this. I thought I could rise above vengeance, but I can't. I'm just a man. I've waited too long, lost too much, and you are a canker in the world that should be cut out for everyone's good. Requiescat in pace, sfortunato. He turned to go, but then a peculiar thing happened. The Spaniard's hand curled round the staff he had been holding. Immediately it began to glow with a brilliant white light, and as it did so the whole great cavern of a chapel seemed to whirl round and round and the Spaniard's cold, cobalt eyes snapped open. "'I'm not quite ready to rest in peace, you pitiful wretch,' said the Spaniard. There was a mighty flash of light, and the attendant priests and cardinals, together with those members of the congregation who were still inside the chapel, collapsed, crying out in pain, as curious thin beams of translucent light, smoke-like in the way they curled emerged from their bodies and travelled into the glowing staff which the Pope, now standing, held in a grip of steel. Ezio ran at him, but the Spaniard shouted, 
No, you don't, assassin, and swung the staff at him. It crackled in a strange way, like lightning, and Ezio felt himself thrown across the chapel, over the bodies of the moaning and writhing priests and people. Rodrigo Borgia wrapped his staff briskly on the floor by the altar, and more smoke-like energy flowed into it and him from their hapless bodies. Ezio picked himself up and confronted his archenemy once more. You are a demon, cried Rodrigo. How is it that you can resist? Then he lowered his eyes and saw that the pouch at Ezio's side, which still contained the apple, was glowing brightly. I see, said Rodrigo, his eyes glowing like coals. You have the apple. How convenient. Give it to me now. Vai a farti fotere. Rodrigo laughed. Such vulgarity. But always the fighter. Just like your father. Well, rejoice, my child, for you will see him again soon. He swung his staff again, and the crozier's hook smashed against the scar on the back of Ezio's left hand. A shock thrilled through Ezio's veins, and he staggered back, but did not fall. You will give it me, snarled Rodrigo, closing in. Ezio thought fast. He knew what the apple was capable of, and he had to take a risk now or die in the attempt. As you wish, he replied. He withdrew the apple from his pouch and held it aloft. It flashed so powerfully that the entire lofty chapel seemed for a moment to be illuminated by bright sunlight, and when the gloom of the candlelight returned, Rodrigo saw eight Ezios ranged before him. But he remained unruffled. It can make copies of you, he said. How impressive. Hard to tell which is the real you and which a chimera. But that'd be hard at the best of times, and if you think such a cheap conjuring trick is going to save you, think again. Rodrigo swung out at the clones, and each time he hit one, it vanished in a puff of smoke. The ghost Ezios pranced and fainted, lunging at the now worried-looking Rodrigo, but they could do no harm to the Spaniard other than to distract him. Only the real Ezio was able to land any blows, but they were minor glances. Such was the power of the staff that he was unable to get close enough to the vile Pope. But Ezio quickly realized that the fight was sapping Rodrigo's strength. By the time the seven ghosts were gone, the repulsive pontiff was tired and out of breath. Madness imparts an energy to the body that few other things can, but despite the powers the staff imbued in him, Rodrigo was after all a fat old man of seventy-two, and suffering from syphilis. Ezio put the apple back in its pouch. Breathless after the fight with the phantoms, the Pope sank to his knees. Ezio, almost equally breathless because his phantoms had necessarily used his energy to disport themselves, stood over him. Looking up, Rodrigo clutched his staff. You will not take this from me, he said. It's all over, Rodrigo. Put the staff down and I will grant you a swift and merciful death. How generous, sneered Rodrigo. I wonder if you'd give up in such a supine way if things were the other way round. Summoning his strength, the Pope rose abruptly to his feet, at the same time slamming the foot of his staff against the ground. In the dimness beyond them, the priests and people groaned again and new energy whipped from the staff against Ezio, hitting him like a sledgehammer and sending him flying. "'How's that for starters?' said the Pope, with an evil grin. He walked over to where Ezio lay winded. Ezio started to take the apple out again too late, for Rodrigo crushed his hand with his boot, and the apple rolled away. The Borgia stooped to pick it up. At last, he said, smiling. And now, to deal with you. He held the apple up, and it glowed banefully. Ezio seemed as if frozen, trapped, for he was unable to move. The Pope leaned over him in fury but then his expression calmed, seeing his adversary completely in his power. From his robes he drew a short sword, and, looking at his prostrate foe, 
stabbed him deliberately in the side, with a look of pity mingled with disdain. But the pain of the wound seemed to weaken the power of the apple. Ezio lay prone, but watched through a haze of pain as Rodrigo, thinking himself secure, turned and faced Botticelli's fresco of the temptation of Christ. Standing close to it, he raised the staff. Cosmic energy arced out of it to embrace the fresco, a part of which swivelled open to reveal a secret door through which Rodrigo passed after casting one last triumphant look back at his fallen enemy. Ezio watched helplessly as the door closed behind the Pope, and only had time to fix the location of the door before he passed out. He came to, he knew not how much later, but the candles were burned low and the priests and people had vanished. He found that although he was lying in a pool of his own blood, the wound Rodrigo had delivered had cut into his side and touched no fatal organ. He got up shakily, leaning against a wall for support and breathing deeply and regularly until his head cleared. He was able to staunch his wound with strips torn from his shirt. He prepared his codex weapons, the double blade on the left forearm, the poison blade on the right, and approached the Botticelli fresco. He remembered that the door was concealed in the figure on the right-hand side of a woman bearing a fardel of wood to the sacrifice. Stepping close, he examined the painting minutely until he had traced the barely visible outline. Then he looked carefully at the details of the painting both to the right and left of the woman. Near her feet was the figure of a child with an upraised right hand, and it was in the tips of the fingers of this hand that Ezio found the button that triggered the door. As it opened, he slipped through it and wasn't surprised that it snapped shut behind him immediately. He would not think of retreating now in any case. He found himself in what looked like a catacomb corridor, but as he cautiously advanced, the rough walls and dirt floor gave way to smoothly dressed stone and a marble floor that would not have disgraced a palace, and the walls glowed with a pale, supernatural light. He was weak from his wound, but he forced himself onwards, fascinated and more awed than scared, though he was still on his guard, for he knew the Borgia had passed this way. At last the passageway opened into a large room. The walls were smooth as glass and glowed with the same blue iridescence he'd seen earlier, only here it was more intense. In the centre of the room was a pedestal, and on it rested, in holders clearly designed for them, the apple and the staff. The rear wall of the room was punctuated with hundreds of evenly spaced holes, and before it stood the Spaniard, desperately pushing and poking at the wall, oblivious of Ezio's arrival. Open, damn you! Open! he cried in frustration and rage. Ezio came forward. It's over, Rodrigo, he said. Give it up. It doesn't make sense any more. Rodrigo spun round to face him. No more tricks, said Ezio, releasing his own daggers and throwing them down. No more ancient artefacts. No more weapons. Now, let's see what you're made of, Vecchio. A smile slowly suffused Rodrigo's debauched and broken face. All right, if that's how you want to play it. He shook off his heavy outer robe and stood in his tunic and hose. A fat but compact and powerful body, over which little bolts of lightning raced, gained from the power of the staff. And he stepped forward and landed the first blow, a vicious uppercut to Ezio's jaw that sent him reeling. Why couldn't your father leave well enough alone? asked Rodrigo sorrowfully as he raised his boot to kick Ezio hard in the gut. He just had to keep pursuing it, though. And you're just like him. All you assassins are like mosquitoes to be swatted. I wish to God that idiot Alberti had been able to hang you along with your kinsmen twenty-seven years ago. The evil resides not with us, but with you, the Templars, rejoined Ezio, spitting out a tooth. You thought the people, ordinary decent folk, were yours to play with, to do with as you pleased. 
But my dear fellow, said Rodrigo, getting a body blow in under Ezio's ribs, that is what they are there for. Scum to be ruled and used. Always were, always will be. Stand off, panted Ezio. This fight is immaterial. A more vital one awaits us. But tell me first, what do you even want with the vault that lies beyond that wall? Don't you already have all the power you could possibly need? Rodrigo looked surprised. Don't you know what lies within? Hasn't the great and powerful Order of the Assassins figured it out? His torvid tone stopped Ezio in his tracks. What are you talking about? Rodrigo's eyes glittered. It's God! It's God who dwells within the vault! Ezio was too astonished to reply immediately. He knew that he was dealing with a dangerous madman. Listen, do you really expect me to believe that God lives beneath the Vatican? Well, isn't that a slightly more logical location than a kingdom on a cloud, surrounded by singing angels and cherubim? All that makes for a lovely image, but the truth is far more interesting. And what does God do down here? He waits to be set free. Ezio took a breath. Let's say I believe you. What do you think he'll do if you manage to open that door? Rodrigo smiled. I don't care. It certainly isn't his approval I'm after. Just his power. And do you think he'll give it up? Whatever lies behind that wall won't be able to resist the combined strength of the staff and the apple. Rodrigo paused. They were made for felling gods, whatever religion they belong to. But the Lord our God is meant to be all-knowing, all-powerful. Do you really think a couple of ancient relics can harm him? Rodrigo gave a superior smile. You know nothing, boy. You take your image of the Creator from an old book, a book, mark you, written by men. But you are the Pope. How can you dismiss Christianity's central text? Rodrigo laughed. Are you really so naive? I became Pope because the position gave me access. It gave me power. Do you think I believed a single goddamn word of that ridiculous book? It's all lies and superstition, just like every other religious tract that's been written since people learned how to put pen to paper. There are those who would kill you for saying that. Perhaps. But the thought wouldn't disturb my sleep. He paused. Ezio, we Templars understand humanity, and that is why we hold it in such contempt. Ezio was speechless, but he continued to listen to the Pope's ranting. When my work here is finished, Rodrigo went on, I think my first order of business will be dismantling the church, so that men and women may finally be forced to assume responsibility for their actions, and at last be properly judged. His face became beatific. It will be a thing of beauty, the new Templar world, governed by reason and order. How can you speak of reason and order, interrupted Ezio, when your entire life has been governed by violence and immorality? Oh, I know I am an imperfect being, Ezio, simpered the Pope, and I do not pretend otherwise. But you see, there is no prize awarded for morality. You take what you can get and hold on tight to it by any means necessary. After all, he spread his hands, you only live once. If everyone lived by your code, said Ezio aghast, the entire world would be consumed by madness. Exactly. And as if it hadn't been already, Rodrigo jabbed a finger at him. Did you sleep through your history lessons? Only a few hundred years ago or so, our ancestors lived in muck and mire, consumed with ignorance and religious fervor, jumping at shadows, afraid of everything. But we have long since emerged from that and become both wiser and stronger. Rodrigo laughed again. What a pleasant dream you have. But look around you. You have lived the reality yourself, the bloodshed, the violence, the gulf between the rich and the poor, and that is only growing wider. He fixed his eyes on Ezio's. There will never be parity. I've made my peace with that. You should too. Never. 
The assassins will always fight for the betterment of humanity. It may ultimately be unattainable, a utopia, a heaven on earth. But with every day that the fight for it continues, we move forwards out of the swamp. Rodrigo sighed. Sancta simplicitas. You'll forgive me if I've grown tired of waiting for humanity to wake up. I'm old, I've seen a lot, and now I've only so many years to live. A thought struck him, and he cackled evilly. Though who knows, perhaps the vault will change that, eh? But suddenly the apple began to glow, brighter and brighter, until its light filled the room, blinding them. The Pope fell to his knees. Shielding his eyes, Ezio saw that the image of the map from the Codex was being projected on the wall which was dotted with holes. He stepped forward and grasped the papal staff. No! cried Rodrigo, his claw-like hands futilely gripping the air. You can't! You can't! It is my destiny! Mine! I am the prophet! In a terrifying moment of clear truth, Ezio realized that his fellow assassins, so long ago in Venice, had seen what he himself had rejected. The prophet was indeed there in that room, and about to fulfill his destiny. He looked at Rodrigo, almost in pity. You never were the prophet, he said, you poor deluded soul. The Pope sank back old and gross and pathetic. Then he spoke with resignation. The price of failure is death. Give me at least that dignity. Ezio looked at him and shook his head. No, old fool. Killing you won't bring my father back, or Federico, or Petruccio or any of the others who have died either opposing you or in your impotent service. And for myself, I am done with killing. He gazed into the Pope's eyes, and they seemed milky now and afraid and ancient, no longer the glittering gimlets of his foe. Nothing is true, said Ezio. Everything is permitted. It is time for you to find your own peace. He turned from Rodrigo and held the staff up to the wall, pressing its tip into a sequence of the holes spread across it, as the projected map showed him. And as he did so, the outline of a great door appeared, which, as Ezio touched the final hole, opened. It revealed a broad passageway with glass walls inset with ancient sculptures in stone, marble and bronze, and many chambers filled with sarcophagi each marked with runic letters, which Ezio found himself able to read. They were the names of the ancient gods of Rome, but they were all firmly sealed. As he passed along the passageway, Ezio was struck by the unfamiliarity of the architecture and the decoration, which seemed to be a strange mixture of the very ancient, of the style of his own time, and of shapes and forms he did not recognize but which his instinct suggested might belong to a distant future. Along the walls there were carved reliefs of ancient events, seeming not only to show the evolution of man, but the force which guided it. Many of the shapes depicted seemed human to Ezio, though in forms and clothing he could not recognize. And he saw other forms, and did not know if they were sculpted or painted, or part of the ether through which he passed. A forest falling into the sea. Apes, apples, croziers, men and women, a shroud, a sword, pyramids and colossi, ziggurats and juggernauts, ships that swam under water, weird shining screens which seemed to convey all knowledge, all communication. Ezio also recognized not only the apple and the staff, but also a great sword and the shroud of Christ, all carried by figures who were human in shape but somehow not human. He discerned a depiction of the first civilizations, and at last, in the depths of the vault, he encountered a huge granite sarcophagus. As Ezio approached, it began to glow, a welcoming light. He touched its huge lid, and it lifted with an audible hiss, 
though feather-light, as if glued to his fingers, and slid back. From the stone tomb a wonderful yellow light shone, warm and nurturing as the sun. Ezio shielded his eyes with his hand. Then, from the sarcophagus rose a figure whose features Ezio could not make out, though he knew he was looking at a woman. She looked at Ezio with changing, fiery eyes, and a voice came from her too, a voice at first like the warbling of birds, which finally settled into his own language. Ezio saw a helmet on her head, an owl on her shoulder. He bent his head. Greetings, prophet, said the goddess. I have been waiting for you for ten thousand thousand seasons. Ezio dared not look up. It is good that you have come, the vision continued. And you have the apple by you. Let me see. Humbly, Ezio proffered it. Ah! Her hand caressed the air over it, but she did not touch it. It glowed and pulsated. Her eyes bore into him. We must speak. She tilted her head as if considering something, and Ezio thought he could see the trace of a smile on the iridescent face. Who are you? he dared ask. She sighed. Oh, many names. When I died it was Minerva. Before that, Merva and Mira. And back again and again through time. Look. She pointed to the row of sarcophagi which Ezio had passed. Now, as she pointed at them in turn, each glowed with the pale sheen of moonlight. And my family. Juno, who was before called Uni. Jupiter, who before was named Tinea. Ezio was transfixed. You are the ancient gods. There was a noise like glass breaking in the distance, or the sound a falling star might make. It was her laughter. No, not gods. We simply came before. Even when we walked the world, your kind struggled to understand our existence. We were more advanced in time. Your minds were not yet ready for us. She paused. And perhaps they still are not. Maybe they never will be. But it is no matter. Her voice hardened a fraction. But although you may not comprehend us, you must comprehend our warning. She drifted into silence. Into that silence Ezio said, None of what you're saying makes sense to me. My child, these words are not meant for you. They are meant for... And she looked into the darkness beyond the vault, a darkness unbounded by walls or time itself. What is it? asked Ezio, humbled and frightened. What are you talking about? There's no one else here. Minerva bowed down to him, close to him, and he felt a mother's warmth embrace all his weariness, all his pain. I do not wish to speak with you, but through you. You are the prophet. She raised her arms above her, and the roof of the vault became the firmament. Minerva's glittering and insubstantial face bore an expression of infinite sadness. You've played your part. You anchor him. But please be silent now, that we may commune. She looked sad. Listen. Ezio could see all the sky and the stars, and hear their music. He could see the earth spinning as if he were looking down from space. He could make out continents even on them, a city or two. When we were still flesh, and our home still whole, your kind betrayed us. We who made you. We who gave you life. She paused. And if a goddess can shed tears, she shed them. A vision of war appeared, and savage humans fought with handmade weapons against their former masters. We were strong, 
but you were many, and both of us craved war. A new image of the earth appeared now, close by, but still seen as from space. Then it receded, becoming smaller. And Ezio could see it now as just one of several planets at the centre of whose orbits stood a great star, the sun. So busy were we with earthly concerns, we failed to notice the heavens. And by the time we did, as Minerva spoke, Ezio saw the sun flare into a vast corona, shedding unbearable light, light which licked the earth. We gave you Eden, but we had between us created war and death and turned Eden into hell. The world burned until naught remained but ash. It should have ended then and there, but we built you in our image, we built you to survive. Ezio watched as from the total devastation that seemed to have been wrought upon the earth by the sun, a single ash-covered arm thrust skyward from the debris. Great visions of a wind-swept plain swept across the sky, which was the roof of the vault. Across it marched people, broken, ephemeral, but brave. And we rebuilt, Minerva continued. It took strength and sacrifice and compassion, but we rebuilt. And as the earth slowly healed, as life returned to the world, as the green shoots thrust up out of the generous earth once more, we endeavoured to ensure that such a tragedy would never be repeated. Ezio looked at the sky again. A horizon. On it, temples and shapes, carvings in stone like writing, Libraries full of scrolls, ships, cities, music and dancing, shapes and forms from ancient times and ancient civilizations he didn't know but recognized as the work of his fellow beings. But now we are dying, Minerva was saying, and time will work against us. Truth will be turned into myth and legend. What we built will be misunderstood. But Ezio, let my words preserve the message and make a record of our loss. An image arose of the building of the vault, and others like it. Ezio watched as if in a dream. But let my words also bring hope. You must find the other temples, temples like this, built by those who knew how to turn away from war. They worked to protect us, to save us from the fire, if you can find them, if their work can be saved, then so too might this world. Now Ezio saw the earth again. The skyline of the roof of the vault showed a city like a vast San Gimignano, a city of the future, a city of towers crushed together which made a twilight of the streets below, a city on an island far away. And then all coalesced once more into a vision of the sun. But you must be quick said Minerva, for time grows short. Guard against the Templar cross, for there are many who will stand in your way. Ezio looked up. He could see the sun burning angrily as if waiting. And then it seemed to explode, though within the explosion he thought he could discern the Templar cross. The vision before him was fading. Minerva and Ezio were left all alone, and the voice of the goddess now seemed to be disappearing down a tunnel of infinite length. It is done. My people must now leave this world, all of us. But the message is delivered. It is up to you now. We can do no more. And then there was darkness and silence, and the vault became a dark underground room again with nothing in it at all. Ezio turned back. He re-entered the antechamber and saw Rodrigo lying on a bench, a dribble of green bile oozing from a corner of his mouth. I am dying, said Rodrigo. I have taken the poison I kept back for the moment of my defeat, for there is no world for me to live in now. But tell me, Tell me before I leave this place of wrath and tears forever. 
Tell me, in the vault, what did you see? Whom did you meet? Ezio looked at him. Nothing. Nobody, he said. He walked back out, through the Sistine Chapel, and into the sunlight, to find his friends waiting there for him. There was a new world to be made. This audiobook was recorded at Chatterbox Audio and produced and published by Penguin Books Limited, recording copyright 2013.